Hello. Good morning to everyone, especially to the people who are participating from Denmark and Sweden and are online. Thank you for being with us. And um, I would like to, first of all, introduce a little bit uh, how this project got the idea or how this seminar was born. And my name is Hela Kiman, and I'm a head of research at the Estonian Maritime Museum. And I'm very glad to welcome both the presenters, the, the our guests, and of course the online participants. So as we know, why it's important when uh, me and Art Doyle, who is a researcher in the naval history at the Estonian Maritime Museum, we thought like the importance of this event today or the seminar and discussion is that uh, Estonian history is endangered with sea mines because the Baltic Sea and the uh, Gulf of Finland were the most densely mined sea areas in the world or during the book in the world during the Baltic World Wars. So that was of, of course one of them arguments. And the other one was um, we started um, actually to think about um, when it comes to the museum that our collections, uh, our underwater weapon collections are actually pretty rich. And we should really uh, not only collect, but also research. So the idea came to maybe describe, to map, and to really gain the knowledge. And, uh, and the result could be like a publications or improve the visitor's experience so when it comes to the, the military history, underwater weaponry, including sea mines. So we started the project in November. It's very, very much in the, in the beginning stage. But um, and here we have some people who are participating there. I mean, um, we have uh, Beto Samato, we have uh, Ulma Stresen, we have here uh, Deinberg, we have uh, Art Doyle. So there is a lot of people who actually contribute to this project. And uh, and of course, uh, we can't do it without the Baltic Sea region context. And all from the both uh, perspectives, the historical perspective and the contemporary Siemens perspective. So that's why I hope that today's uh, present, like presentations and the discussions will contribute not only to the future collaboration, but also to this, to this topic. So like maybe we can learn something new, we can exchange some ideas, and also we can later use it when we, when we try to describe in a scientific way our collections. Okay, and a little bit maybe practicalities about today. Uh, we start the first panel, uh, we start now, uh, is um, uh, dedicated to the historical perspectives of the sea mines. And the uh, moderator will be uh, Artoil. And the second part is um, about focusing on the contemporary sea mines, and uh, then I will step in as a moderator. And, uh, and then we, we try to do like this, that uh, we will listen to the presentations, then it's a possibility to ask the questions. And uh, both, of course, it's, there is also, I want to tell to the people online that it's also possible to post the questions on online. We will welcome them very warmly. And, uh, and then we have a little bit at the end of the session, we have like 15, 20 minutes discussion for that everyone, both all presenters and all uh, participants can actually post the questions. And maybe we can a little bit, yeah, to give the ideas and get the discussion. And the same thing about the second panel that we start at one o'clock because we have a lunch from twelve to one. And 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 then we hope that at three o'clock we can sort of conclude some some ideas and um, maybe talk a little bit about the future collaboration and uh, and of course um, uh, thank people who have been involved to this. So from my, my side, this is all, and uh, now I have the honor to give the floor to the director of Estonian Maritime Museum, Mr. Urma Stresen, who, by the way, has been participating in this expeditions to gather and to collect the mines, and who can actually tell us some words about how sea mines at Maritime Museum have been uh, Good morning, everyone. Of course, not, not only me, not at all, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but then... Uh, hmm. Sea mines and, uh, and maritime museum and their activities are very tightly connected to our submarine. Because uh, if I go back to the history, it, it started started quite a quite a lot from the submarine lambit, getting the submarine lambit taking over from the from the Soviet uh, Red Fleet Army Museum in 1992. In April, 
And after that, we created a open air museum in Lendington, um, in Pirit Olympic Harbor, with a, of course, with a submarine, with a naval warfare, with the mines, and thanks to the naval officer Vladimir Koppelman, who was a main organizer and keeper of this uh, this period also in uh, in submarine Lendit and all this area. And in in the mid 90s and even even in the late 90s, uh, we never had a thought about the mine museum. No, no. Mine museum was uh, some something what came later. And as some things in uh, it can be it can be developed from the uh, catastrophe. And uh, we had uh, some kind of catastrophe also in, but a catastrophe only, but uh, uh, we had our our territory, our our small harbor in Pirita. Uh, by many reasons, uh, we, we lost it. We lost it uh, just uh, quite closely in the, Turn of the century in 2001. After that, when when Savary Lambit was in uh, quite major repair in uh, in uh, Porti Dockyard, it was all quite good, and then the old things went quite wrong. And um, and because uh, all these uh, mines, uh, what we already had, it was necessary to find. To just to find a place for them, and uh, we had many plans with this uh, place here in in old town. Uh, it's called uh, Old Street. Uh, old uh, gunpowder, gunpowder is storage or fisher uh, hugelder as as we call it. And uh, we had preliminary plans to just to uh, to keep it as a storage room. There was other plans also to the, to to just uh, convert it to the maritime museum, uh, which is for museological. Thing. We had uh, so many plans also to do some some other exhibitions there, but uh, but finally, when it's uh, what was quite clear that uh, we can't develop our area, our place in Pirita Harbor, uh, that was quite clear that that's the only only way to do it in to create a sea mine museum uh, and it finally yeah, we opened it in september early 9th or 7th of september in 2012 then the main organizer to this was uh, after Vladimir Koppelman was the Tainberg, and uh, we opened it it was uh, somehow it was done if I, if I start to think about nowadays how we do the things and how how we do organize the exhibitions and labels and all those uh, things um, multimedia it was done very simple way it was done really in that way like a big mine storage and it happened and fitted very well to this uh, old uh, okay it's not cellar but we, we still call it the Fisher Hogel Rakikan. Sometimes it was confused to, as it's the same name of the place is in Tartu, but that's the entire restaurant. We don't have it there. And um, so we started from 2002, from September, and uh, Vladimir Koppelman was there, and we had very nice uh, old sailors who kept it, and uh, it also worked like a like a, some kind of training base for the to the naval uh, young officers and because uh, it was a place where it was possible to see the old sea mines and uh, some were not so old and we got a very good uh, uh, examples uh, from Finland sad for I'm very thankful to Forum Marionum and uh, Mine Museum in Pansion uh, we got I even can't remember that, but uh, more than 10 examples uh, of sea mines uh, from Foro Marinum, from, from Pansio. And so it is. I guess when we opened it, uh, we had mines that are around, around 60. Now, uh, 
I can't tell you is it is it's a it's the biggest mine museum, but the, okay, it's a, in this surroundings, I guess it, it was the biggest mine museum. Yeah. But okay, once it was more. And um, so it so it and of course uh, it worked well up to the 2007 2008 and after that uh, after that it was uh, one of the economical crisis uh, in all Estonia and also in museum and uh, and in 2009 it was quite clear that uh, I must cut from the museum budget around 1 million Estonian kron uh, and uh, we even had a had a, not the idea to, to close the mine museum. We still kept it open, but uh, but it was rather difficult years. And and finally, two thousand and nine, when it was quite clear that uh, we had a second possibility to start the development in uh, Seabrain Harbor in Lenosadam, and that was quite clear that uh, okay, we can close this mine museum here in Old Town, but uh, all mines got to have almost all we can transport and the great new exhibition area in a seaplane harbor in the in the ground floor and so it is so it is today we still have those mines and now it's a great time to to develop it more because uh, uh, in seaplane harbor we close the museum in january and uh, we start the new permanent exhibition developing uh, in four months' time, and we create something also in a, a, with our sea mines, but they will stay there in uh, in Seaplane Harbor. That's that's, uh, that's a short story. How the seaplanes arrived to Maritime Museum? It's all connected to to Lempit, and we must remember this. Uh, Officer Vladimir Koppelman, who is now passed away, because uh, it was uh, more or less his idea and uh, to create some kind of that kind of uh, open military warfare museum. And uh, now its uh, idea is developed, and it is, and uh, it's quite nice. So today in our harbor in cruise terminal is uh, uh, is a um, British ship Albion uh, here and. So Albion is built exactly in the same yard uh, in Barrow and Furnace as Um For that, I guess I wish you all good for today. And that's all. Thank you. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Estonian Maritime Museum, I also welcome you here to the international seminar. And this year we are focusing on sea mines. And our seminar has divided into two parts. The first is the historical perspective. The other part is more concentrated on the contemporary issues regarding sea mines. Uh, in this panel, the historical panel, we have three presenters from Denmark, from Finland, and from Estonia. And uh, in the historical uh, perspective of sea mines, uh, we are looking mostly at the 20th century but we will get a glimpse to the 19th century as well. And uh, we have the opportunity to compare how, for instance, Denmark, Finland, and Estonia prepared their naval defenses for possible opponents in the interwar period. Uh, what was the general idea of how to use the sea mine in naval concepts, defense concepts, and how the countries developed this underwater weaponry in general? There is an old saying, uh, which regards mostly to the small states, that the sea mine is the most effective weapon of a poor country or a small country with limited resources. And the period in question that we are observing today, <coughs> and mostly the first half of the 20th century, we can see that the sea mines, uh, how sea mines were used in naval warfare during the 19th century, we can see that there's only a few examples, few wars, mostly the United American Civil War, which saw extensive use of sea mines, and also the first modern war, which has by historians have been used or called 
World War Zero, uh, the Russia Japanese War, which also saw the extensive use of sea mines used to blockade harbors, which proved to be very effective for the Japanese. Of course, the technology of sea mines did not uh, have some kind of a revolutionary development in the first decades of the 20th century, but also during the World War II, the Germans started to advance in this area significantly. Our first presenter today is Brigadier General Retired, Mr. Michael Clemson. Mr. Clemson is the author and editor of many articles, books, research papers, and in Estonia, Clemson is really known. He has been the de Danish defense attache in the Baltic States and also the commandant of the Baltic Defense College from 1998 to 2004. Unfortunately, Mr. Clemson cannot be here in person, but he has prepared a pre recording for us to view. And after we have viewed it, there is a possibility to answer questions to Mr. Clemson himself, who is with us via the internet. I'm sorry I couldn't attend in person. The reason is that I think it's important that Denmark is represented here at the conference simply for the reason that for nearly 150 years, uh, the Danish Navy developed some of the best uh, experts in uh, naval mining operations. Uh, it was the result of the various naval tasks uh, that the service had in uh, between the North End and uh, uh, Baltic Sea in the Straits there. I shall outline the development throughout the period here during the presentation. It all started with a failed mining experiment in the 1864 Schleswig War. In 1867-69 followed intensive studies abroad to prepare the use of mines against a cool landing in Copenhagen Harbour. That mine defence initially consisted of two rows of shore control target mines in the harbour access channels, one in the outer channel and a second one in the inner channel. The mines were placed individually by special small steam vessels as shown on the picture to the left. The secondary channels next to the inner channel were blocked by booms as indicated on the central chart. During the next 10 years, mining was under direct control of the Army Engineer Captain Christian Arendrup on the left and with the naval officer Ferdinand Juncker right in ex given expert support. From 1880 onwards, the mine defenses were combined with the emerging torpedo service by Juncker under the Navy's uh, lo technical logistics service, meaning under the naval yard. Uh, if you look at the right-hand map, you can see that the German Joint Army Navy planned uh, for an attack against Copenhagen that was developed in 1897 to 98, included a naval bombardment of the city. The plan proved the relevance of the mining, simply because the two outlined German landing operations in the plant were placed outside the city limits. Around the turn of the century, the technological development meant that the anchored minefields protecting Copenhagen against bombardment or cool landing could be controlled via cables as shown on the upper right sketch. The barriers could be laid quickly with special mine layers as the one showed on lower right and connected with cables by divers. Thereafter they could be armed or disarmed from land stations or a boat uh, via buoy. The effect of the mine barriers were combined with the coastal forts and searchlights plus patrol craft placed at night at telephone buoys around the harbour. The chart 
to the left shows the winter 1912 Copenhagen Fortress Seafront Plan. It shows the prepared mine barriers and the closed defense arches of the fort's light quickfine cannon. The portrait shows the plan's author, the then Seafront Commanding Rear Admiral Christian Middlebow. The basic and green marked and anti-bombardment black mine minefields marked on the chart could be supplemented by additional forward barriers of active mines led by torpedo boats. It required even, uh, if required, uh, they could even be placed in Swedish territorial waters to prevent, prevent their use by German artillery ships. From the turn of the century, the growing size of battleships meant that the Great Belt became the key route for a fleet entering the Baltic Sea. Here is shown on the uh, Royal Navy chart of the Baltic approaches uh, on the left. The coal-fired fleet would need an offshore coaling base to sustain operations into the Baltic Sea. Establishing such an offshore base in Danish territorial waters would violate the country's neutrality. To counter any such possibility, in 1909 Denmark decided to develop a forward base for part of the navy in Smolensk far uh, the area covered by the Red Circle. The base will have controlled mine barriers and coastal forts on islands as shown on the right-hand sketches. Other forts would defend the fleet transit route south of the main channel of Sealand between the Great Belt and the Sound. When the First World War broke out, the transit channel forts were under construction. The forward island forts had not been started and they would never be such a defense against a likely Royal Navy coaling base was a tacit pro-German neutrality guard activity. However, the commanding Vice Admiral from 1911, Otto Hansen, shown on the portrait, considered this both logical and necessary. He considered that a German-English naval war would break out in the near future. And the only way to keep Denmark from being involved would be to give the Danish neutrality defense a profile signaling that it would be unnecessary for, German, for Germany to invade Denmark to protect her north flank against England. To do so, the Danish armed forces should create and sustain the most effective neutrality defense possible against English landings in Jutland and block easy support of the English fleet in the, uh, in the Baltic Sea approaches. As the straits were to be kept open, uh, that was the maximum that could be done. More only became possible to, uh, when it became possible to reinforce that profile on 5th August 1914. Then the German envoy asked Denmark to mine the belts against all belligerents. The Admiral worked successfully for a positive Danish government response. Three days later, the Navy had led the here shown unplanned mine barriers blocking the Great Belt. The little belt was deliberately kept open for German Navy use. The Vice Admiral deployed half the Navy's service combatants to the Great Belt with a directive to defense the minefields fighting against any Royal Navy in passage attempt. Throughout the war, Kofel Hansen modernized and reinforced the Great Belt minefields against an English passage. The Danish minefields were continuously refreshed and mines replaced with types improved by the Royal Navy shipyard inspired by technology from stranded mines. From early 1916, the effort included mining to block any attempt to send dived-in submarines through the deeper channels of the Great Belt. 
The chart of the Great Belt to the right shows the situation in May 1918. This was one month after uh, Kurt Hansen's death of untreated diabetes. Actually, the Royal Navy never used the Great Belt to send submarines into the Baltic Sea. Uh, the British always exploited the international and initially online channel of the south between Denmark and Sweden. In August 1915, the English submarine E-13 misnavigated and ended on a sandbank east of the Danish island of Salton. The boat was both was from the second group of English submarines sent through the Sound. The first group had passed the Sound in October 1914. However, the German Navy attacked and destroyed E-13 in Danish territorial waters. The destroyed submarine is shown to the left. Kovar Hansen knew that it had been his Navy's obligation to fight the Germans to defend the boat. He also realized that if the English tried again here, there would be a risk of an escalation to the Danish-German hostilities that he considered could become a national disaster. To minimize that risk, he supplemented the new German minefields shown in green on the map to the right. A new Danish mine barrier was led between the islands of Amager and Salton in February 1916. He also ordered the arming of the hitherto unarmed mines of the anti-bombardment barrier south of Copenhagen in the Kirke Bight. When the Swedes did the same, and with a re reinforced German Navy presence in the Sound, the Sound became close to English submarine passage. With reinforced Danish Great Bell Field and a new and a new German obstacles further south and east in the Great Belt, no more English submarines arrived in the Baltic Sea from the west. At the end of the First World War, the Danish Straits had become open again, and the Western navies led by the Royal Navy operated in the Baltic Sea for a period in support of the Baltic States and Polish wars of independence. See the map in the center. Thereafter, likely future wars were considered to be involving the new little states on one side and the revisionist Soviet Russia and later Soviet Union plus possibly initially Germany on the other. The Western navies would then return on the league flag in support of the new state to discipline the non-league rogue states. The Soviets and Germany Germans would try to mine the straits to hinder the entry, and the navies of the regional league members such as Denmark and Sweden would combine to try to block that attempt. Within that situation, Denmark would have to defend Copenhagen against the pressure of bombardment, and therefore the plans for minefields around the capital such as the northeastern barrier shown on the right illustration, they were updated. The just built two small torpedo posts, as the one shown below here, were employed as supporting mine layers. Vice Admiral Kofel Hansen's pro German. A uh, neutrality line from the First World War was copied and reinforced by his successor as commanding admiral 20 years later. Two months after the new war had started in autumn 1939, Germany asked Denmark to mine the three likely channel for a potential new Royal Navy submarine passage into the Baltic Sea. Denmark complied. Immediately, 
The Vice Admiral Jan Marasnisser, shown to the left, had worked hard from the start of the decade to improve his service relations to the German Navy. The German Navy commander, Erich Reiter, had responded with a promise that his country would respect Danish neutrality in a new war. When the Germans did invade Denmark six months later, the Copenhagen harbor defenses remained passive and Reschnisser ordered his navy not to resist the Germans. Ten years later, Denmark joined the Atlantic Treaty Organization as one of the founding members. The Alliance mission for the Danish Navy was initially primarily mining of Laurations meant to hinder the Soviet Baltic Red Banner fleet from passing through the, the Straits and especially its force of a growing force of attack submarines uh, that would be a threat against the Allied sea line of communication as the German U-boats had been in the two world wars. Therefore, large barrier minefields would be placed at the southern ends of the Straits, as shown on the map. The large minefields would be covered and defended by the guns of new coastal, uh, coastal forts, see the maps to the left and right. These mine barriers would also hinder or at least handle sea landings on the coast of the main island of Zealand, the most likely places being on the eastern coasts south of Copenhagen. The threat here meant that the most likely beaches and harbors would be covered with fields or more limited mining of special types of mines. The total number of mines planned for anchored mines, bottom barrier mines, anti-invasion mines, etc., was initially nearly 8,000. That mine number was far larger than in the earlier period. Therefore, the Nanis had both specialist ships for mine operation, as the one shown in the center and below right, and it also planned to use suitable state ships such as environmental protection ships and vessels for that purpose. After the Cold War, the Danish mine war capability was nearly totally disbanded. The reason was that the threat against Danish territory was assumed to have disappeared forever. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Mr. Plemerson for this interesting presentation. Are there any questions, Mr. Plemerson, regarding his presentation? I would like to use this opportunity myself then and ask uh, uh, Have you had the opportunity to research uh, what was the Danish naval mine construction? Uh, did the Danish uh, build their own sea mines or did they bought them in from abroad? What are you talking about? <clears throat> the question about what types we used? Uh, yes, were the Danish made sea mines? Uh, uh, the Danish, uh, in, in the interwar period, the, the sea mines were uh, Danish produced or copies from uh, stranded mines. But after uh, the Second World War, uh, the mines were initially NATO standards. But of course, the Danish technology also meant that some of the special mines were developed and improved so that the, so they would be especially well uh, um, adaptable to, to, the Danish, to the Danish missions such as anti-invasion mines. Okay. Uh, but of course, the 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 the, the triggers, the the the, the um, fuses were, were becoming more and more sophisticated, and uh, the Danish Navy became an expert in in both in the technical field and the tactical field in using those mines and improving them. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you for your answer. Uh, also, I would like to ask, uh, uh, did the Danish Navy uh, conduct any kind of cooperation, for instance, with the Swedes or the English of developing uh, sea mines during the Asian war periods? Uh, I'm not aware of that. We were, we were very, very closely with the Germans because when the uh, Bundeswehr uh, uh, with the Germany entered, the Federal Republic of Germany entered NATO, there was a division. So the FEMA belt uh, to the south of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, of the Danish island of Lolland and Falster uh, became a German Navy responsibility. Uh, so uh, the uh, depth of the minefields in the strait was in, increased, and there was a very, very close relationship between a cooperation between the uh, uh, the Federal German Navy and the Danish Navy from 1970 onwards. Uh, they were came combined in uh, commander naval uh, naval uh, 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 forces and Baltic approaches. So. There was a very, very, very close and comradely uh, um, uh, relationship with the Germans. The Brits uh, did not involve themselves very much in the Baltic, except by submarines, uh, most of the Cold War. Okay. Uh, I would also like to ask, uh, in the year 1918, uh, when the British used Copenhagen as an operational base for their naval operations in the Baltic Sea. How did the Danish Navy view this? Did they welcome the British? Because I've heard that uh, the Danes had some kind of uh, not so positive feelings about it, that the British are using Copenhagen as this kind of base. Uh, the, the, uh, the Danish Navy attitude to the British Navy was somewhat ambiguous because in 1807, uh, they have stolen the Danish Navy uh, and and uh, bombarded Copenhagen, so we were had some hard feelings, but basically the cooperation was very close, depending on the attitudes of the different naval officers. Of course, the uh, the commander of the Danish Navy in Copenhagen, in the harbor area of Copenhagen, was a bit frustrated when the uh, British Navy uh, in the in the harbor started to inspect foreign ships. And thereby breaching the former Danish neutrality, but um, as uh, but Denmark involved itself, uh, especially the the uh, liberal conservative part of the Danish people involved themselves even then in the support of the Baltic states. As you remember, we sent a volunteer company. Uh, uh, it should have been a battalion or even more, but the Estonian. Uh, finance ministry was unable to support Churchill's last force. And because the Swedes misbehaved in the war of independence somewhat badly in Narva, uh, the attitude to, to other support for the Finnish and British was somebody half-hearted in Estonia, as you remember. But, but uh, the Danish, when, when the, uh, the special or the coastal uh, torpedo boats of the of the of the British intelligence attacked into Kronstadt Harbor. Um, there was a Danish observer with uh, uh, with the uh, uh, the cruiser flotilla uh, in in uh, uh, in in Tallinn. Uh, so so uh, so it did the. the some part of the Danish Navy officers, they were very close to the British and others were skeptical. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do we have some questions from online? Oh, sorry. Yes, Mikko, please. Should I come there or please? Uh, okay, so Mikko Baronen from, from Forum Baron in Finland. I have a question of a bit uh, older period a bit prior to your your presentation so the 1864 uh, those first mines that were purchased by the by the danish uh, danish uh, military danish navy uh, i've understood that there was also uh, finnish built mines by carl of the Ramstedt purchased by the by the danish navy to prevent the russian invasion uh, have you some information about those first uh, naval mines used in, in Denmark. 
I have no information about that. We have some questions from online. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your answers. And uh, we will continue. Uh, the next presenter. Sua Naita, an agamist. Our next presenter comes from the Forum Marinum in Turco, uh, Mikko Meronen, who will give us an overview of. Uh, the development of mine warfare by the Finnish Navy from 1918 to 1944. Please. So I have a theme for mine warfare development by the Finnish Navy from 1918 to 1944. But also, as we spoke about the collections, so I start with the, with the background of, of our collection. So we have a quite large uh, collection of underwater warfare material, especially naval mines. And uh, the collection started already in 1918 during the uh, First World War mine sweeping operations. So it was the training collection uh, as our origin, and it was an important part of, of training in 1920s until the 1970s and 80s, you can say, and even still today. Uh, the collection was first located in, in uh, Helsinki, uh, in Katajanotto base, and then uh, it was moved during the Second World War to Turku, to, to, the, to the new naval base in Turku. First plans to uh, configure that already as a mining museum were in the late 1970s. But uh, it was uh, built as an exhibition uh, in mid 1990s by Commander Eero Alvinen, who was a good friend with uh, Vladimir Koppelman also. So these both gentlemen shared the same interest for these old naval mines. Uh, and uh, the mine museum worked in, in Pansio uh, until 2020-2019 by Eero Alvinen and his fellow uh, naval officers. And we were starting to take over the, the collection a bit and, and uh, trying to uh, make it better. But then we had to had to move the, the collection due to the uh, premises. It was the old uh, naval base tunnel. We had to give it up. And we were in trouble with the collection. We had over 100 naval mines, torpedoes, mine sweeping gear. What to do with, with that material? Luckily, we came in contact to DA Group, uh, who is also presenting today. Jukka Venermo is, is here to speak about modern naval mines. So they offered us a space in Forsta at their headquarters where we were able to build a new, new exhibition about underwater warfare and also locate our, our main part of our collections. Uh, because it's not very openly available to all, all people, uh, of course, it can be visited by groups on certain days. Uh, so we uh, opened it also online in the digital museum. So you can also see the collection collection there. And also the collection was documented last year. And uh, it's also the information about the, the mines is available on, online also in the Finnish Finna service. It's short uh, information about uh, about the mines, not very large, <laughs> large research yet, but hoping to do more. So about the background of the Finnish uh, Finnish uh, uh, Mine warfare. It started already in the 1918 with the big mine sweeping operation. Uh, there was a famine in Finland during and before and during the uh, and after the civil war in the winter of 1918. And in the spring, the key thing was to get the shipping going and get the food into the country. So the uh, in April also the uh, already the Senate and they, uh, started to think about the mine, mine sweeping operation, and even before the uh, last Russian Navy units left Helsinki in the spring of 1918, when the Germans had arrived, uh, there was also negotiations starting about the mine sweeping operation, and so the Finnish volunteers were gathered as a, a new mine sweeping unit, uh, which was 
uh, trained by, by the German Navy. And in the, during the first summer 1918, it was uh, incorporated in the, into the German Navy minesweeping units. So we had already uh, my, my, sorry. Get backwards. <laughs> so it was in, incorporated in the in the Finnish, in the German Navy at the beginning, and it was carried under the direction of Finnish Maritime Board because there was no naval order, organization yet. Uh, by the autumn, there was already four minesweeping half squadrons with uh, ten to sixteen motor uh, and steam minesweepers and auxiliary vessels. And when the Germans withdrew in the November 1918, the minesweep units were incorporated into the new Finnish Navy. You can say that the Finnish Navy was kind of a built on, on minesweeping at the beginning. So this was the minesweeping squadron in 1919 uh, at the beginning. Mostly it was used uh, uh, old or quite new actually, most of them uh, uh, mine, uh, small motor motor boats, small steamboats uh, built for the Russian Russian uh, Navy uh, during the First World War. And during the mine uh, clearing period, it was already almost 3,000 uh, square nautical miles sweeped. And with the Germans, when they swept the first summer, they mostly exploded or, or detonated the mines by shooting or some other means. But for the new Finnish Navy, we needed all the equipment that was available, and they were available there in the sea. So they were mostly disarmed, which was, of course, highly, highly risky and highly dangerous work. So almost oh, over 900 naval mines were disarmed for further use. So that formed the base for the Finnish uh, naval warfare. Or, of course, we have storages with Russian mines. I tell about them a bit later. <clears throat> so there are the areas that were swept in different years in the early 1920s. Uh, the uh, mostly in the Gulf of Finland, the Archipelago Sea, and the and the Oland Sea, and some uh, shipping lanes to the towards the Estonian coast. Mostly it was used old Russian mine sweeps from the First World War period. Uh, uh, the main equipment was this ML3, one of the uh, first equipments used. This is the Finnish designated uh, to the Russian Russian uh, mine sweep. And then uh, the, mine, the weapons at the, at the beginning consisted mostly of, of the Russian Russian mines, mainly uh, models of 1908 mm -hmm. and 1912 were, were the key part of our and uh, our, our storages in the in the early 1920s and 30s, and even to the Second World War. So almost thousand of both of these types were were in storages in Finland. And then the first operational, the first mining operation was carried already in the August of 1918. Uh, all the our ex uh, Russian mine transport. Boy was converted to a mine laying ship, and actually that was the, our own, uh, our only real real mine layer until the until 1940, and that carried out the first mine laying operation to protect uh, the base of the of the British naval unit that was located in in Bjorko in Koivisto Sound. It was laid uh, German mines and also these Russian mines. To barrage the, the entrance to the to the Bjerke Sound. Then some key personalities from from the early or for, from the uh, development period. So Eino Huttonen, you can say he was the father of the Finnish mine warfare development and research. He was a mechanical engineer and was trained by this German uh, training unit in 1918, and he was the commander of the mine company during the mine sweeping period. And he did lots of development and testing with these old Russian sweeps, trying to make them work better and, and develop them further. And he became the head of the Naval Command Mine and Torpedo Bureau, Torpedo Department. 
and uh, in, during the Second World War, he was the doctrine officer of the naval mine worker. And uh, he ended up to be a chief of staff of the Finnish Naval Command. So you can see how high uh, the weight the naval mines and the mine warfare had in the Finnish Navy. So he became a chief of staff at, at the end. Uh, unluckily, he died in a, in a mortar accident in 1949. Then some uh, NCO personnel, Mikko Altonen, here as an ex example of, of one career. He was also trained by the Germans and was uh, involved in this mine clearing, clearing sweeping, sweeping operation in the early 1920s. He became a mine warfare specialist, mine master, and, and, and a trainer, and worked in the mine workshops building new naval mines during the Second World War and after. And actually, he is the person who has built the, 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 the as the foreman building of the contact mines uh, in the 1950s that are still operational. There was lots of uh, uh, development and training and learning done in 1920s and 1930s. There's, for example, a, a Russian M12 mine, and then also some uh, hydro uh, traffic uh, calculations because it was uh, hydrostatically uh, anchored or moored. So uh, there was lots of calculation done uh, to, to, uh, to try to understand how, how the mine works. And also ex extensive training uh, in 1920s and 1930s to different types. And there you can see, for example, these kind of notebooks that all, all conscripts or uh, trainees on the, on the naval Naval uh, uh, the schools did on their mine, mine courses. And there is one more bit more beautiful drawing as an anchoring of, of 1908 model mine. But in all the plans in 1920s and, and 30s, it was calculated that we needed more mines than we actually had. So, so we had to get some more. But it was not possible due to the financial reasons to purchase huge amounts of mines. So it was uh, done everything to do the new ones. So all kinds of modifications and collections from the old Russian uh, equipment. Uh, this Finnish mine type, for example, it uses a, a fortress mine or land contact mine from, from Russian Japanese war, fitted with her hertz horns and put on a, on a uh, model 1908 carriage and the anchor and mooring me mechanism. So all kind of combinations to, to produce new ones. Only new mines were possible to be acquired was, was for, the, for the submarines. And uh, uh, our people uh, acquired uh, five submarines in 1930s and four of them were mine laying capable. The largest uh, type, the Vetehinen class, could carry 20 mines in total. And also the tiniest one, the smallest submarine, south of, of 99 tons, even that one could play mines. A new uh, mines for the, for the submarines were designed. Uh, it was the S-30 model, which was designed in, in, in Finland, but still built in Sweden. And then we tried to purchase some German mines or also for the submarines, but due to the winter war and the German neutrality during that, so we couldn't get them until the spring of 1941. During the winter war, luckily we had a period of preparation uh, and we could make preventive mine barriers late and early and early enough. So they, they were laid already in October, way before the Soviet offensive in the, late, in the end of November. And most of the old storages were used to these minefields. So we were almost run out of mines after the winter war, mine, mine uh, laying operations. Luckily, there were no large scale invasions by the, by the Soviet Navy. So we could manage with, with those. Some mines we, tried to build new ones, 
and whole production uh, factory was actually built. Uh, so the whole, uh, all the functions of the Finnish defense forces were decentralized uh, uh, during 1939 or late 1939. And uh, the main work, mine workshop and the naval base was located from Helsinki to Turku. And, and uh, also the mine workshop then was uh, moved to, to Uusi Kaupunki, to Janhua, where there was an old sawmill that was acquired as a, as a mine workshop. And that uh, started working and the production started in 1940. It was also a huge industrial cooperation with different companies uh, to produce new mines. And this became kind of a hub or or a center for the Finnish mine and underwater warfare uh, production. Over 5,000 mines were produced during the Second World War years in this Yanhua workshop. There's some photos from the mine workshop. Uh, these photos are from 1950s from Turku, but the similar uh, production line was, was in, in, in musical during the early war. And also the industrial cooperation, you can see some wheels there. For example, there is wheels for, uh, from uh, Four City Dynamite Company, uh, which is even uh, even today uh, an operator in the Finnish uh, mine industry, a company called Four City, which is still making the judges of our modern naval mines. So they were doing this same job already, already in 1940s. And the uh, production of, of the mines started with this one, uh, S40. Uh, design uh, was started already in the late 1930s, and the finish was, uh, and the design period was then hurried up, and, and the production started in the in 1940. First batch was completed in, in the June 1940. Also, new mine layers were acquired. Uh, they were also designed. In late 1930s, experiences were collected abroad, and domestic builder Triton Vulcan was chosen to build them. But uh, due to the Winter War uh, delays, so they were completed just after in 1940. Uh, actually, Estonia had, had a plan of a, of a mine layer. Maybe Arthur is going to tell about that. That could have been even better than our ones. And the end of the winter war was kind of a disaster in the naval perspective. We had to give up the Hanko uh, Peninsula as a, as a naval base for the Soviet. So that was direct threat to the Finnish shipping lines and also a big threat for possible landing operations. So we had to plan for new new war. And uh, experience were gathered from the winter war and uh, new mine barrages were planned, but we had only like 2,000 mines left. And then we had to purchase more. Luckily, we were able to acquire uh, over 2,000 more to the 1941. The general situation was, was quite tricky for the Finnish Navy and the Soviet threat was, was imminent. And uh, shipping, routes to the Gulf of Finland were closed and the naval units had to be deployed into two, two separate areas and the Soviets had a short attack run to our coast. So the defensive minefields were, were planned and some smaller barrages even laid in the end of 1940s and beginning, 40 and beginning of 1941. But then started the Finnish-German cooperation. And uh, uh, these naval matters were also discussed in the, in the May and, and, and June 1941. And new bar mine barriers were planned together with the Germans. And we had to actually, actually adjust our own ideas for mine, mine uh, laying, because we were uh, used to lay some quite tight, uh, small fields with some wide areas in between them to be, uh, enable the own operations by own motor torpedo boats and, and submarines. But Germans wanted to block large area. So they have wanted to wide, widespread large area mine, mine barriers. 
So we had to accommodate for that. And then the Kriegsmarine arrived in, in June, way early <laughs> before their, their uh, Barbarossa operation to the Finnish coast. And they laid out uh, huge mine barriers in the west, western part of the Gulf of Finland. And our uh, mine layers then uh, uh, added on those, those barriers. And we had to plan also the occupation of the Orland Islands. Uh, we had to get them fast. So it was uh, organized uh, this kind of operation Regatta to, to reach the Orland Islands very fast with, and, and occupy them with, with troops. And also mine laying on that. And the first mine, mine fields were laid uh, uh, on the Estonian coast by Finnish submarines. Uh, and Estonia was still kind of kind of independent due with the with the Russian bases. So these uh, uh, submarine commanders did question these orders. Uh, what what shall we do? It's not war yet, but but they said that it's, it's already high enough behind this. So just carry on. And this operation regatta was carried out uh, with the troops to to the Poland Islands and also mine lay uh, to protect. Uh, this operation and, and, and the Dolan Islands. And during that operation, also the Finnish naval units got to their first contact with the, with the Soviet Soviet Air Force. And the barriers were laid in the Holland Islands and then carried out more to the Gulf of Finland. And during that period, also the first influence mines were started to be used, mostly to the shipping lines uh, towards the Hanko. Uh, base, the Soviet base, then required some German magnetic influence mines, and also some scientists were needed to prepare and, and adjust the magnetic, uh, magnetic mines to the local conditions. There is the parachutes of Gulf of Finland in 1941, and then of course the most uh, effective one, the Yuminda mine barrier, uh, to the shipping line from Tallinn to Leningrad. And that was a huge operation. Our mine layers were working there for one week with, with, uh, with uh, uh, one load of mine, mines uh, every day. So there is the Rotsin Salmi laying mines to the, to, the, to the barriers. And both of uh, the commanders of the of these mine laying ships uh, received the uh, Mannerheim trophies, the highest uh, military order in, in, in Finland due to their uh, operations on, on the mine laying. There's a war diary of, of Rotten Sami from this Yuminda mine barrage uh, laying operation. And uh, this is just an example to see how, how large fields they were with, uh, with huge amount of different types of mines. But from Finnish mine fields, you can see also that there is the lots of different types and very old types because they were scrapping the, all the bottoms of the storages. And this ended up into this uh, catastrophe outside uh, uh, on the shipping lane from Tallinn to to Leningrad, where the uh, Soviet uh, Baltic fleet ran into this mine, mine barrier. Also, this mine barrage is affected a little bit the evacuation of Hanko, but we had already run out of mines. So we couldn't uh, put more uh, on, on, the, on the northern side of, of the Yuminda barrier, which was planned, but we, but we ran out. So the, when the Soviets evacuated Hanko in the in the December 1941, they managed to slip on on the north side of of those large barriers. But then also some uh, some uh, uh, failures also happened. We lost uh, our coast defense ship Ilmarinen to a mine, even though we had uh, developed these uh, Paraman sweeps, protective sweeps in 1930s, trying to make protective sweeps against uh, the bigger uh, vessels, but uh, the sweep didn't function as it's supposed to be. 
probably it was due to the speed. There was not enough speed when the, when they were carrying out the, the operation. So the the parallel sweep got caught, caught up in the anchor mooring of, of a mine and it dragged under the ship with with uh, with the uh, bad bad uh, <laughs> happening. So the uh, results of these operations in 1941, the Soviet fleet was flogged to the Gulf of Finland and to the Leningrad. And 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 it was uh, made possible by the, by these mine mine laying operations, and we had to plan the new operations for the October in the end of 1941. But we were again in this mine hunger, trying to find some new mines, and we had to consider the Soviet uh, submarine fleet because they patrolled in the northern Baltic, and the mine barrages made it dip more difficult. But we had to block them. And some submarines got through in 1942 and caused uh, problems still. So the new barriers were laid in the eastern part of the Gulf of Finland and then up to the middle part, part of the Gulf of Finland. Uh, and uh, new mines were acquired uh, German mines, uh, EMC, EMD, international types were acquired by the Finnish Navy. And also uh, our own mines, new mine types were started to be coming out from the production line. S41 and S43, which were designed during the war. Uh, S41 based on, on German models and S43 based on, on old Russian designs and own development. And both of these are still operational types in the Finnish naval forces. All of these mines were also could be equipped with uh, antenna equipment uh, for anti-submarine mine barriers. So this uh, antenna that stretched out a bit from from the top of uh, from, from the uh, from the mine void, so it uh, extended the area that the mine could cover in depth depth wise. And these antenna mines were widely used in these anti-submarine mine barriers. There is, for example, the eastern uh, Gulf of Finland barrage uh, laid together with the, with the German Navy, Seehund and Sea Eagle barrages, German ones, and the combined completed with, with Finnish, Finnish mine barriers. And there is the kind of an idea of how, 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 how the diagram, how, how the mines were laid in different degrees and different uh, depth settings for anti submarine use also. Also, and then the Porkala barrier in the center part of the of the Gulf of Finland, and that was even more uh, concentrated on uh, on the anti-submarine uh, barrage, and it was completed with the anti-submarine net uh, in 1943, laid by the German Navy. And there you can see also the depth uh, diagrams of different. Uh, mine piers used in the Borkala barrier. And this uh, was a huge anti submarine net laid, laid by, the, by the Germans. We completed, our Navy completed the netting with, with the smaller, older nets in, in our coastal areas. And during the war, was active also in the development field. Eovina Maki was one person that was uh, in the experimental unit. It was a mine testing department of the Finnish Navy, and uh, he his unit tested and developed for especially different kind of mine sweeps. And this development made possible to this uh, after the mine clearing operation after the Second World War. For example, one type of sweep that was uh, developed during the Second World War. Unfortunately, I have text here in Finnish, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so it was the uh, U-type sweep uh, with two uh, sweeps behind small vessel. So this was a vessel that was capable uh, or a sweep that could be could be uh, uh, used by, by a smaller vessel, lighter vessel, uh, and, all, and could be operated uh, on, a, on a very uh, dangerous situations with very shallow mine depths also. And uh, this type of a sweep is still in operational use 
and it's, it's probably going to be a base for even some modern development further on. It, it could be uh, uh, connected with different uh, modifications, and all of these kinds of modifications were extensively tested during the during the war years. And it could be equipped both with the mechanical cutters and also with uh, explosive cutters. There is, for example, connection for for a uh, explosive cutter that cuts the the anchor uh, mooring cable. And then uh, also the magnetic mines were starting to be swept. There we had some Danish assistance or purchased also some Swedes from Denmark and, and then also from Germany. Magnetic uh, uh, sweeps with, with huge magnetic buoys uh, uh, dragged by, by, by sweeper vessels. And also uh, information or testing about the degaussing systems were started to be gathered and developed. We purchased from Germany uh, Eco's hosting equipment, and it was uh, put up a station outside Helsinki that was used for degosing uh, uh, all vessels that were operating on the on the dangerous areas, and also some new acoustic sweeps for uh, sweeping out the acoustic mines. There is an example from the German uh, German hammer. Uh, box type of, of uh, mechanical mechanical handle box type of type of a, of a drum box type of a, of a acoustic sweep, and then we had even our own X weapon. So they tried everything on the on those uh, experimental units, and and they developed even an office, offensive X mine. Idea was to launch uh, drifting mines to the eastern part of part of Gulf of Finland, hoping that they would drift into the Bay of Kronstadt, where they would anchor because they had developed this fuse uh, kind of a uh, super beat type by type of a, of a fuse that that melted in, in a few days, and and it's it uh, started the anchoring uh, mechanism. And as you see, even there was used an old Russian fortress mine from 1904 as an, as an anchor for that. That was never taken into operational use because it was going to be too dangerous for our own vessels and own, own shipping. And after the war, then the mine sweeping operation again. Thank you. Thank you, Mikla, for the very interesting presentation about the Finnish Navy and the Naval Mine Power. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, please. Thank you, Mikla. One question about the uh, S40 uh, mine uh, yeah. model. Because uh, complete, uh, all the United States, uh, for it, it's from the uh, British and German. Uh, so it, it was uh, probably the design was based. This design was based mainly on 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 on, uh, on, uh, on the Russian models. Mm -hmm. uh, the boy and the head horns was like 1908 uh, type type of a mine, quite quite much. And then anchoring mechanism, it was a combination of different different uh, design, mainly based on on old Russian Russian plans. And and but also we purchased some some British mines also for experimental use. So we had some. Some British uh, mines also in Finland that could be could be uh, on basis of of, uh, of my testing. So, it, uh, but it was completely Finnish uh, design and, and Finnish manufacturing. It was used for different companies for production of the parts. Uh, workshop industry produced anchor mechanisms and wires and all kinds of uh, that. And uh, Finnish uh, electrical industry, Strömberg and other companies produced uh, the electrical parts. Uh, one one problem there was yeah with the mine was the buoy, the buoy of the uh, we couldn't during the uh, the winter war we didn't have possibility to to press the halves of the mine buoys yet, so we had to purchase them abroad. So they were purchased from Sweden and also from the US. <laughs> and and but then I don't know I don't have researched that much yet, 
what happened we probably got from germany or somewhere a precedent mechanism for for the next ones so in the during the continuation war we already could produce the own voice good morning uh, um local um, with the mayors or other what we are going to insane courses, my company is a courses start of any dark or end with a fine picture like that. Or yeah, each name is like a or this one or, or some of the others, and then everyone laughs because it's safety measures and stuff like that. By the way, Ukraine is now they are not laughing at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my question is um M7 during wartime and the post conflict is a bloody dangerous business business center. What was the death rate? Uh, accidents went blowing up during uh, actually 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 for the mines themselves quite low. We lost only like few people on, on mines itself. But but other accidents on the sea it happens. <laughs> so so there was lots of uh, like uh, uh, after the Second World War, it was like now 26 is the old number. Now, now it's kind of like 28 or something like that. People were lost after the Second World War. Mine. Because of mines? Uh, not all because of mines. It, during the mine sweeping operations. So, most dangerous thing was those, uh, as I understood, were those uh, uh, explosive cutters. Because they are small explosives. And when you do end the operation, and if they haven't functioned, because you have one sweep and you have like eight explosive cutters on one one end of, of a sweep, and when you took that up on a deck, you take small explosives that are already armed or back on deck. So that was dangerous. And after the First World War mine clearing operation, the most dangerous type of mine or in the boat wars was the was the Russian fish mine, that kind of uh, mine, fish shaped mine used uh, in the shallow areas and river, rivers and things like that. That had a mechanical uh, detonator, me mechanical trigger, uh, spring loaded trigger. So that was a really dangerous one. The one one exploded off this 19, early 1920s. Die, two, I think two men died to that. And then one exploded in 1942 when they tried to disarm it. And after that, we have a mine, uh, this, uh, mine disposal manual. Uh, and there is said for this Russian fish mine, you never try to disarm that. <laughs> so you always, so that's, that was uh, considered too dangerous. And also the difference in the in the first and the second world war mine sweeping was that during the second world war mostly they were shot, not disarmed like this. This is only uh, in those mines that you wanted to have an example, or you what you were in that kind of position that you couldn't detonate it there because it was too too much building, so people or something around. So so then you died tried that. Uh, I have one more question, yeah. perhaps. Uh, you mentioned in 1918 that the Germans uh, taught the Finnish naval personnel how to conduct the naval warfare, <coughs> mine warfare, and so forth. Uh, has it been studied uh, how long, how much personnel was actually schooled in this regard? Uh, so <laughs> there was uh, four, four flotillas already operational. Yeah. It was several hundred persons, but <laughs> but there is a but also because most of these volunteers that came in to that German training, they they didn't stay in, in the Finnish Navy because they were mostly they were uh, well educated people that had also civilian professions and civilian careers. So mostly in early 1920s they left and went back to their civilian careers. And not didn't stay in the Finnish Navy, so they were quite few actually that came through this German training and stayed in the in the naval service. And the sea mine was a central concept in all of the Finnish naval concepts uh, from 1918 onwards, right? Yeah, because we kind of inherited. I must say that the, we inherited the strategical use of the naval mines from the Russian Navy, you can say, because we inherited the stocks 
of, of huge stocks of mines and also the ideology to use mine barriers as a, as a, as a strategic weapon. And that you can say that we we already inherited from the from the Russian uh, Russian Navy. And also it, it has been carried out and, and kind of a, uh, further developed and especially during the Second World War, we got even more experience in this field. So it, it's carried until today that we have we consider the, the naval mine as a, as a, or one of our one of only our our strategical uh, uh, weapons systems. Okay. Any more questions? I'd like to just ask uh, more about sort of the research methods and uh, sources. Yeah. How I mean how how these sources are are they very accessible? For example, when you mentioned the the mine perches and the mine barriers, I mean they got logical materials and it's archives. Is it in Finland or is it the other state? Uh, for example, I have one. <laughs> One bunch of copies that that are all the minefields, uh, all the Second World War mine barrages, <laughs> because they were gathered for the mine uh, clearing commission of the Second World War, and it was widely copied out. Uh, that kind of a uh, uh, kind of a diagram of all, all the fields. Uh, it's it's with the, with the coordinates and mine type. Or, Laying time, so all the all the navies supplied that to the to the uh, mine clearing commission after the Second World War. Probably there is one from the First World War also, but that I haven't haven't seen. But that, for example, is one ex example. I have provided that to the to the Finnish naval forces so they can use that information. And I think it's been incorporated in this NATO uh, uh, maps that you have you use today. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then we have of course we have uh, uh, quite a lot of manuals of different types of of, of mines and sweeping gear and things like that uh, from from the from the uh, uh, 1920s and from the from the second world war period. Okay, thank you, Miko, very much for the interesting presentation. And we will continue now with our last presenter, which is me. My name is Otto Oil, I'm a researcher at the Estonian Maritime Museum, and I will be giving a brief presentation with how to see my Estonian and Naval Defense concepts. Of course, we cannot go really that much in depth into these concepts, but we can get a general overview of how a small country with a small navy uh, built the best possibilities to defend uh, the territorial waters and coastal areas. Uh, if we start uh, with the beginning, there are uh, there are some similarities. Uh, for instance, like Mika spoke about the, the history of the Finnish Navy, or how it began and how it developed, uh, and it is quite interesting to view these two navies operating at rest because the Estonian development ended uh, roughly in 1939-1940, but the Finnish one continued. Uh, if we st start talking about the general situation of when the Estonian Navy started to operate, uh, it was of course in the Estonian War of Independence, and as you can see, the sea lines are heavily mined, mostly from the western part of the Estonia, Estonian territorial waters, and there was only a one we had pathway, the so to speak, red track that went through the minefields. This lane was cleared by the Germans to gain access to town. But uh, if we're talking about uh, the personnel of the Estonian Navy uh, during World War One, or even in the Imperial Russian Navy itself, then we have to conclude that the, yes, there were some senior officers who even graduated the Naval Academy, but the vast majority of Estonian officers who started to guide and lead the Estonian Navy in times of war were actually wartime officers. And the vast majority of these officers were civilian mariners, captains, navigational officers, even mechanics, who were drafted during World War I and received their wartime officer rank as an ensign and 
if they progressed in their career during the war, expressed personal bravery or something like that, they were promoted to lieutenants. So that was basically the general core of what the Estonian Navy had to operate with. So few people actually received a naval education in a classical sense of studying in academy or the Moscow Corpus or any other variety of the Russian uh, naval educational system. Uh, but despite all of, the, all of these shortcomings, the Estonian Naval Officer Corps uh, did receive a significant amount of experience during World War I, especially because they were civilian mariners. They were mostly stationed on mine trawlers, mine layers, uh, depot ships, and a lot of different auxiliary vessels, which means that a lot of them actually took part in mine laying, in mine sweeping, uh, most of the time in the Gulf of Riga, uh, but also on the Gulf of Finland, uh, which means that uh, they did have significant knowledge of mine warfare and how to operate in this field. But of course, the problem was uh, because when the war started, uh, one of the first and most important tasks was to guide British squadron into Tallinn and to provide maritime protection or naval protection of the capital town, which means that uh, navigating between all these uh, sea mine lines, which we know went adrift, the coordinates uh, on paper did not match the reality of where the mines were actually stationed which means these were extremely dangerous times. And when the Estonian Navy was started to develop and to be formed for the defense of Estonia, one of the first key elements was to clear all the minefields. Uh, the Estonian Navy itself, uh, during the entire Estonian War of Independence, uh, did conduct some mine laying operations uh, in January 1919 and in May 1919. Those ones are the more significant ones because those were laid here and here. The main uh, sea line to Kronstadt to the enemy base. Uh, these operations were extremely difficult, uh, carried out uh, by the crews because, uh, for instance, in January, uh, the mine laying operation was uh, conducted out in icy waters. Which, were, which meant that these operations took a significant navigational skill and knowledge of where the minefields are in the Gulf of Finland, what the enemy probably is doing, where you can meet the enemy, and so forth. So the risks were very great, but the Estonian Navy uh, emphasized that to conduct operations on the northern banks of Estonia, on the northern parks of Estonia, uh, the Navy must secure uh, so to speak, the sea area that the enemy would not attack the naval or instant landing operations, which would be conducted on the coasts. So, in conjunction with a lot of beach landings and amphibious operations, uh, at the same time, the risk operations were carried out to lay the first uh, minefields by the Estonian Navy. Uh, there were other ones, uh, smaller ones, especially in June 1990 and in October in 1919 there are few <clears throat> information about these these are located here and here uh, because in the estonian archives we have absolutely no information about these just references that they were made uh, and for instance the coordinates for this june date minefield uh, came out in the british archives in london where we get the coordinates and finally managed to solve this puzzle which was always a question mark, when was it laid, what did it consist of, and so forth. Uh, when Mick got, uh, briefly introduced the so-called Rukka sea mine, or the small wood mine, which was mostly used in shallow waters, so these small minefields were uh, laid with the Rukka sea mines. And in the Estonian uh, literature, historical literature, it has been proclaimed that the three uh, the Soviet uh, destroyers that were sunk in the Popolia Bay at the time of the Estonian Navy was conducting its largest ever uh, maritime naval operation, the Krasnoy Bank operation, which was uh, masqueraded as an aid to the Northwestern Army's advance towards Petrograd, 
but at the same time, the general idea was to conquer the ports of Krasna and Gorka and to use those large caliber artillery pieces to actually destroy the Soviet fleet in Kronstadt. Uh, these minefields were laid, but these were more of a defensive kind of minefields because uh, as the Estonian thought that the three Soviet destroyers which were sunk in roughly this vicinity, but of course, because of the Rilke mines, the explosive charge was roughly about 10 to 15 kilograms of, of uh, wet gunpowder or TNT, depends on the type. And these mines were not capable of sinking the destroyer. So these were just uh, laid there as a precaution. So when a ship would strike it, uh, the enemy would have to retreat or speculate that more larger minefields are ahead of them. And perhaps not continue with that operation. So this experience of mine laying that was going to maybe have in the war of independence. Uh, but the, a few words uh, about the, also the mine sweeping division, which was formed in early 1919. The main task of this division was to actually uh, sweep the areas of mostly coastal waters in the Western Estonian territorial waters. But uh, the problem with this division was that it, although it consisted of 24 minesweepers along with the depot ship, uh, all of these minesweepers were mostly former civilian vessels that were converted into minesweepers, which meant that they could not be operated. They, can, they were not able to operate on high seas. They were only meant to be used in coastal waters, which meant that the, that the general main sea lines uh, main sea mines laid by the Germans and Russians, they could not clear. All of the activities were conducted by uh, maritime pilots that guided the ships through the tally and out. But nonetheless, uh, the minesweeping division of the War of Independence did manage to clear most of the Estonian territorial coastal waters, which meant that shipping between different Estonian coastal cities uh, was put into effect during the war. And uh, because of close cooperation with uh, maritime pilots, the minesweeping division did manage to clear small gaps that went to the open sea and contracted with the red track itself, which basically meant that the, the minesweeping division was one of the most active units in the Estonian Navy during the War of Independence. Here is the general outline of when the uh, minesweeping expeditions occurred. And uh, the end result, of course, was, which was vital to Estonia, was to secure the open sea lanes of communication with the rest of the world, especially Scandinavia, uh, Denmark, uh, Great Britain, France, and so forth, which basically meant that the Estonian Navy uh, provided all the materials along with food, artillery shells, uh, all sorts of ammunition, weaponry, provided to the army to continue the war of independence itself. If these uh, naval activities would, have, would not have been developed in the early stages of the Estonian War of Independence, it's questionable how the whole course of the war would have ended. Uh, well, here are a few examples of what the minesweeping uh, division consisted of. There were only actually two smaller minesweepers slash layers uh, used to minesweepers color and all that. The rest of the boats were improvised, uh, installed with Minesweeping equipment, which was mostly acquired from Finland, they used the Schutz type uh, minesweeps. And here is also the people of Shilipotka. But the operational capabilities of this division was severely limited. But of course, this continued because the Estonian uh, territorial waters uh, was heavily and very densely laid with sea mines which meant that the division itself, as you can see, was uh, liquidated under the Navy in 1921 and carried out under the Estonian Maritime Administration, the minesweeping uh, jobs, uh, way until 1923. Uh, this was also in conjunction with the International Mine Clearance Committee work, uh, which was uh, headed by the Germans. Uh, they were basically ordered by the Allies to clear all the mine areas to which they laid in during the World War I, which means that this was uh, done somewhat in conjunction with each other 
but at the same time, as you can see, the Estonian capabilities did not reach from the coastal waters, which meant that all the rest of the mine sweeping were actually conducted by the Germans. Uh, but what is interesting to, <coughs> to point out that, that despite the small deficiencies of the Estonian mine sweeping uh, division and the uh, smaller crafts and vessels that conducted these, these jobs, uh, they also operated in the Latvian waters near the city of Einaste and went down south as the opening to the Daugava estuary. Uh, these were happened only in small times, they, but unfortunately we don't have much information about it. We hoped to find this information in the Latvian archives, but no luck there also. So we have just references that these things happened, but what exactly was done and how it was done, we don't know exactly. So until 1923, as you can see, roughly 633 mines were destroyed during this time. Uh, the term destroyed is put here with some kind of a leeway because uh, some of these mines were also deactivated, disarmed, uh, taken into the service of the Estonian Navy. But uh, roughly, when we estimate what the number would be, it would be something around 100 and 150 mines altogether. But when this job was done, uh, in 1923, the Estonia fulfilled its uh, obligations to the International Mines Sweeping Committee. Uh, extra information was gathered from the Finnish side, as Mikko showed the operational activities of the Finnish Navy, which was going on in the 1920s. Uh, additional information was gained by the Estonian Higher Naval Command that around the vicinity of Naisar and the roadstead towards the Helsinki. Uh, there were also sea mines that were laid on a much deeper sea areas, which meant that the mine sweeping division had to be reorganized again. And uh, many warships, for instance, the smaller gunboat Meme, were constructed in mine sweeping duties. And this was the only ship loss of the Estonian Navy during the interwar period or the peace period when the Estonian Navy actually lost a warship. And as you can see, additional. 189 naval mines were found, and most of them, the vast majority of them, were destroyed. So, the naval stocks of the Estonian Navy. This is, without a doubt, one of the most uh, hardest questions to answer because during the Estonian War of Independence, there were uh, factories or factories in play that actually made sea mines to some level. And mostly they were made by non commissioned officers of the Imperial Russian Navy. Uh, some materials say that up to 850 mines were produced or put into active service during this time. It is debatable, but uh, roughly the number, the overall general number of sea mines that the Navy had in the War of Independence is roughly 2,923. Uh, of, of that number, roughly about 1,000 of them were also the Rupa mines or the small move mines. But in 1925, the number of mines have increased, as, a, as you can see, by the end of the 1930s, the number goes down and goes down significantly, and this was attributed to many factors, first of them being that uh, in the early 1920s, the Navy did not have the necessary facilities to store the sea mines. There were some very rudimentary buildings in the Pailasar Peninsula that were officially held. These were mostly wooden buildings that rotted very quickly, and by the early 1930s, a new one stone buildings were created. And the other reason was that Estonia uh, sold and exchanged a lot of its sea mines with neighboring countries, for instance, Finland, Poland, and also to a smaller extent, Latvia, uh, which meant that the naval stock uh, decreased. And as you can see, Uh, the sea mine types or mineral mine types themselves, these are also to some extent Estonian designations, to some extent a mix of des designations, because the Estonians combined uh, the shells of the German um, sea mines with the German, uh, with the Russian anchors of the sea mines, which means that they put the M08 anchor and combined it with an EMA uh, German sea mine shell. So uh, the Estonian Navy itself, uh, from the War of Independence and throughout the 1920s and 30s, uh, saw that the sea mine or the naval mine is uh, one of the main key ingredients of protecting Estonia. This uh, came from um, 
the idea came from practical experiences as well as the re relatively cheapness of the C minus uh, naval weapon. And of course, the geographical conditions also played a role in here because as the World War I and the Estonian War of Independence experience showed on shallow, shallow waters and waters with significant uh, islands and so forth, uh, sea mine operations were actually a preferred method of naval warfare in the Gulf of Finland and in the Gulf of Riga. Uh, there were also um, some small opportunities, or in theory at least, uh, cooperation first began between the Latvian Navy and the Estonian Navy on the premises that to close off the Gulf of Riga to break in the uh, Serbian Peninsula in the Boga, uh, somewhat of a small Gibraltar to seal off the area completely with sea mines and coastal uh, defense batteries. Uh, but uh, these ideas in, from 1919 to 1920 were uh, pushed aside by the Estonian Navy, saying that we cannot operate on two of these uh, areas because we must concentrate on defending the capital Tallinn and the Gulf of Finland, and we cannot have, uh, we don't have enough resources to conduct or do these things both in the Gulf of Finland and in the Gulf of Riga. So uh, later on, the joint naval oper operations between uh, the Estonian and the Latvian Navy actually occurred in the night late 1920s and in early 1930s, but it is not known if uh, some kind of uh, mine laying operation exercises were conducted between them. Uh, most likely, those exercises uh, were in the form of how to operate against the submarines because the Latvia had the submarines and the Estonia had the destroyers and the, both smaller navies try to try to make each other try to yeah make each other more fulfilled in this matter to get knowledge of how to operate against these warship types. But the main uh, persons behind uh, the idea of uh, start cooperating with the Finnish and the Finland, Finnish Navy were, of course, the Rear Admiral Hermann Salsa and Captain Valentin Grenz. Uh, they were the commander in chief of the Estonian Navy in the period of 1925 to 1938. And all of these naval concepts that were developed during this time, uh, they were involved in it in, the, in a smaller or greater extent. Uh, the problem basically was that. Uh, if we only consider the naval, the mine lane part in the naval defense concepts of the Estonian Navy, then in general, these were the mines that the Estonian Navy saw possible to be laid in a short period of time if an enemy would have, would conduct an invasion or an, some kind of an act of aggression or a, a complete invasion into the Estonia itself. Uh, these numbers are not ideal. The Navy itself uh, drew attention to it on many times. And the problem was, was the fleet itself. Uh, the fleet itself uh, consisted of many different warship types with uh, very different capabilities of laying mines and so forth. Uh, and if you can see, uh, Uh, as you can see, there is a significant decrease in from the 1926 to 1934 the naval defense concepts concerning the mine laying specifically. And uh, this happened, of course, because the Estonia lost the main uh, units of the war fleet, namely these destroyers. Uh, both of these ships could carry up to 80 large sea mines. And uh, the main idea was to use these ships for different variety of operations and uh, the mine laying operations were just one part of it. So these ships were always concerned to be used on multi multifunctional purposes. The one problem, the second problem, ships that would lay actually mines were the older Gangon Trembik, which was decommissioned in 1927, could carry up to 60 sea mines. Uh, the smaller but uh, faster and with good maneuverability, uh, torpedo boat Sulak could carry only 10 sea mines. 
And by the late 1920s, the Navy uh, were on the fund. The war fleet was not modernized, which means that all the naval concepts that they produced were the smaller concept programs, the minimum programs, what we can do and what we can achieve. So the main mind main capability of the Australian Navy in, since the late 20s and throughout the 1930s were the two uh, mine layers, which were especially rebuilt for mine layer purposes, the Risma and Suru. Uh, technical data varies on this, uh, how many sea mines they could actually carry, but it is between 150 and 175 each, which meant that the Estonian Navy actually obtained or continued to have the capability of lay sea mines after these destroyers were sold. But the problem was uh, that these ships were uh, uh, very old. And when they were commissioned to the Navy, the Navy personnel said that they can be in service only for about three to four years and they must be modernized or completely replaced. And this went throughout the 1930s. Every yearly, the Navy drew attention to it that we must modernize our war fleet, we must change it. And as late as 1939, 1940, uh, finally the government gave permission to actually start building the new mine layers. Uh, at the time when the Soviet forces were already present in Estonian soil. So, uh, all the defense concepts, uh, how many sea mines to be laid, uh, were actually made by those two ships. Uh, in the later part of the 1930s, when the Navy started to slowly uh, modernize its war fleet with the addition of the Palakula submarines and with the patrol boat Picker, uh, Picker could lay about 50 mines. Uh, these deficiencies were not really remedied uh, by the time of 1939 and the day that the Navy was not in this strong shape actually to provide naval defense or naval protection to Estonia. The, all of the naval concepts were centered around, uh, mostly centered around Tallinn in, um, in cooperation with the coastal defense batteries that Navy would lay minefields if they had the opportunity around the islands of Nysara, Aigna and the vicinity and the Bay of Tallinn. This was the maximum that the Navy could achieve and no more. So in the 1939, uh, the plans of how the Navy were to lay the minefields were as followed. Uh, this um, has been made by our Naval Cadet, who will soon be a Naval officer, uh, taken from the data from the archives and put for the first time actually on the map. Oh, this is the general idea as how the Estonian Navy thought in 1939, taking in consideration its capabilities. So this was basically the maximum which the Navy went into the year 1939. Of course, uh, these minefields were actually never made because uh, the new construction of the mine layers were actually Some reason I can't go back with it. That's the right. Okay. Uh, these mine were still meant to be laid by these because the newer mine sweepers that were meant to be uh, built were on the basis of the patrol boat Victor. Uh, we hope all we have some kind of a preliminary drawings of these uh, because all the naval technical archive was taken by. Uh, the Soviet forces in 1940 taken to Kronstadt uh, or Petersburg, possibly, but we have no idea do they actually exist or were they perished during the Italian evacuation on the field of Unita. So the final thought, the final process of the Estonian Navy end in 1939 in conjunction or abreast compared to the Finnish ones that went forward. But of course, in the closing of the Gulf of Finland, uh, the so-called secret uh, military cooperation or naval cooperation, sorry, uh, were planned to play out something like this. But this concept, uh, we don't know how it would have been, been in use in practice, because this is just speculation of what would have happened. And it is crucial to note that this uh, cooperation was conducted secretly, which meant it wasn't official which also means that if the Soviet Union would have attacked Estonia, it is high probability that Finland would not have declared war, 
by the Soviet Union and vice versa. If the Soviet Union would have attacked Finland, Estonia would probably not have declared war on the Soviet Union, which meant that all of this position would have been obsolete in one way or another. But this was a strategic conception of what Eastern Macedonia would do with the small forces. Uh, there is a small indication to what might have happened because uh, it is conceivable that if the Soviet fleet or the Baltic fleet would have tried to break out of this barrier, they would have, in some form or another, be subjected to heavy casualties. But uh, this concept was played out uh, during the Tallinn evacuation in August 1941 uh, in the minefields of Tumi, which basically means that this concept was in, in a, a, a slightly different form uh, played out in the eastern part of the Gulf of Finland, which was originally planned. So the Estonian Navy history for the interwar period ends over there, and we will, will not take a part of the Second World War. Thank you for your attention. And if anyone has some questions, please make an answer them. Everybody's tired. Okay, yeah. uh, thank you for the presentation. I have two questions. Uh, one is about those uh, three destroyers that were uh, back in uh, 1919. Do we know on which mine did they sank? Were there some British mine fields as well, or it's uh, complete? And, uh, and the other question uh, where do you originate these uh, maps that you show that? They are they from, uh, from the made by the same now that you already mentioned, or uh, you draw them yourself? Uh, actually, it is a team effort how they have been conducted. Uh, the Naval Cadets made in 1939 uh, maps. But uh, okay, I will answer this one first. Uh, most likely, most likely, uh, these were these minefields uh, that the Soviet deployed a lot of time. Because when the, the Estonian literature, yeah, the claims that we did it, and even the Estonian naval officers in the 1930s wrote about mine warfare, said. I mentioned this the Estonian sea mine and the ones that sunk the ships, but in reality, as you can see, in the British Navy extensive mine fields throughout the 1919 campaign uh, into this area. And these were the large sea mines that can actually sunk destroyers. The Estonian ones were just a precaution or, or an early alarm, so to speak, to deter the enemy. Uh, yeah, so it is about 99% sure that these are the British minefields that actually sunk the ships. Uh, these maps are actually made about five or six years ago, uh, most of them, and uh, it has been made in cooperation with Peter Samuelson and Roman Markiewicz over here. So this is this maps are a team effort of the Soviet Union. Thank you. About this nice portrait, like is it from archives? Are they from archives or from like uh, individuals or how? Because it's a really good portrait of them. Uh, what one? Uh, what you were showing about the ships? Oh, like ships. Yes. Oh, they are variety from archives, from our collections, from private, private collections. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Estonian Navy history has the problem that we don't have the photos of all of our warships in right. So we have only the main ones, the main battle fleet ones, so to speak. But even as we mentioned, the mine sweeping division, we don't have any photos of those for the moment. So there were like, there were no like continuous uh, like documentation. Yeah, we know the technical data of, of what size the ships were, so to speak, but there are no visual confirmation for a lot of them. And that is the problem when the country is been occupied. We, we have remnants from here and from there. Uh, the Estonian naval archives have uh, consisted, uh, are in very good shape regarding the 1920s. But from the 1930s onward, especially from the middle of the 1930s, there are large gaps. And since we lost all the technical archives, we don't have drawings of our warships and technical data of those. Uh, so we are, we are in the dark somewhat. And <laughs> yeah. In that yeah. So uh, about the mine, the information after the First World War, whether uh, also Estonian representatives in that information? Uh, yes, there were. There were uh, senior lieutenant one. Dino Krauts, which was the commander of the destroyer Wambola, and actually the commander of the Estonian warship division was dispatched uh, as an envoy to the commission and to advice. So, yeah, there was one there. Yeah. Uh, 
because we have some photos of the one meeting in, in, in Holland uh, quite early probably in, in, in 1919 or, or 1920. And I think probably 1919. Yeah. Uh, I think the Steiner representative went there in 1921 yeah. or something like that. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Let's take a break. Good afternoon in the room, good afternoon in the online. <laughs> we are continuing our seminar about the naval mines. And we reached to the second session, which focuses on the contemporary mines. And maybe some words I could say before I introduce the first presenter. Um, why we chose to actually talk about also the contemporary situation and the contemporary technologies, the contemporary mind warfare in the Baltic um, the sea, and also about the afterlife of the naval mines called the materiality. Uh, the idea was um, a little bit to give the perspective that we can learn from the history because often these two things are very connected so that uh, not to leave the impression that the museum only focuses on the history and we can't use it in, in everyday life at the moment and uh, we will hear as i understand as i would have to say that i'm not the expert on the sea mines but as i understood um after the what, what, the, what we heard on the first session after the world war uh, both uh, world wars that the sea mines became much more intelligent comparing to the, the old, old uh, sea mines, which means like, uh, that, as I understood, that you don't need to sort of meet the ship, but you can also, according to the speed and um, and the sort of um, different the technologies, you can actually direct these. And this means that the mine warfare became much more complicated. And, uh, and of course, we can't forget about the environmental aspect, which we will hear on the last of them, uh, last presentation, the afterlife of these naval mines. And here, I would like maybe just to illustrate a little bit that how these sort of mine shells were used as a material by the local inhabitants on the coastal areas. For example, in Wilson, and the Nature Park in Estonia, people use them as artificial bird nests. So that we will hear on, on, the, on the last presentation of how it's arranged in Sweden, like how the things are used. So I will wish you the very nice um, presentation, very nice discussions, and I will introduce in the first presenter, Inka Venemo from Finland, and he will introduce uh, his work a little bit. Okay, hello everyone. So my name is Ilkhan and I am from DA Group. Uh, brief introduction about the DA Group. So we are a independent Finnish SME company. We've been around soon thirty years. Uh, we work in defense space and with some special industry. And our thing is basically electronics design for for demanding. And the demanding uh, conditions. We have headquarters in Forza, that's also where the underwater exhibition is located. So if you happen to be nearby, then well, it's not open in that way, but if you want to visit there, it's possible to arrange. Uh, and we also have offices in a few other places. I'm personally from Helsinki. Uh, my expertise is underwater signatures. So basically what, what the ships emit, so the sound, magnetics, pressure, electric field, which are the things that the modern mines are measuring and how they are then uh, detecting the targets. Of course, uh, it's not only about mines, they can be different kinds of surveillance systems using the same signatures as well. Uh, so so my, my expertise in, is in signature management. Uh, I have also background in uh, as uh, I'm, a, I'm an engineer and I don't have any like maybe background, but I've been working also with degaussing systems and 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 uh, mine sweeping influence mine sweeping systems and measurement systems. So a uh, very brief thing to history. I think that the room is full with people who have a lot more experience in this field than I. 
And so mines have been used for several occasions. Uh, during World War One, there was this figure that more than 200,000 mines were laid. In the World War Two, more than about a million mines were laid. And then since World War Two, uh, mines have been uh, present in, in several different scenarios. Uh, during the Cold War, and then after the Cold War, it got... And and now in in the Black Sea, there has been been mines, so, but this is just like a very 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 brief history about the naval warfare, mine warfare today. Naval mine lay is still very efficient anti-access area denial in naval domain. That, that means that you can set up minefields and deny the use of sea in these areas. You can canalize sea traffic. You can, you can, you can control where the ships will go and where they cannot go. Uh, modern mines have better chances to select the targets from the old mines. And they are they are effective against underwater targets and unsurface targets. They are safe to store and operate, and mine is quite affordable weapon system. If you compare it to let's say a missile, we talk about completely different uh, magnitude of of price per unit. It's relatively easy to deploy, train, and maintain as it, it, it is a relatively easy system in, in that sense. And it, it can be used as early stage deterrent measure. You, you can lay a protective minefields even before any hostility starts. That's, that's a, then you can show your opponent that, that you are ready to defend. Well, Naval mine laying is not only about mines. Of course, you need to have the mines, but in, in addition, you will need these things. You need infrastructure, logistics, personal training, planning, some kind of concept of operations, so how you're going to actually use your mines. You need the mine laying capability. You have to have some platforms that you need to have the command and control connection so that you have an all, uh, total overview of the situation of awareness, uh, algorithm development, so you know what, how your mind is capable of detecting the targets you want it to uh, be effective against, and then of course testing, maintenance, and other life cycle services. Uh, so, modern naval mine is a credible means for sea deterrence. Uh, it, it's an effective. You can use it in protective, defensive, or offensive way. And then, of course, you can use this kind of mixed back mm -hmm. method because we have modern mines and maybe some older mines together in the same minefields, contact and influence mines. It will be much more, let's say, difficult for the opponent to get rid of. There are limitations. A single mine is a single mine and in a huge ocean so or sea. So you need to have a massing. So you need to have several mines somewhere to actually have a credible effect. A uh, naval mine is a complex weapon <coughs> still. And, and it has a long lasting effect to the use of sea. So, so you should think before you lay your mines. Well, then let's let's come to the actual beef. What is the, the modern smart mine? And somehow to understand what is what is a modern smart mine, I think you first have to ask what is an old-fashioned dumb mine. 
Here we have our, our friend, the spiky ball. Uh, at least my generation know it from the mind sweep again. Uh, th these, these have been invented by actually really smart people. They, they've come up with really smart ideas how to make this work. Uh, also, if we talk about the old influence minds, there has been a lot of smart people putting effort to make good, good systems. But the systems themselves, they are not smart. They are actually really dumb. Uh, this kind of contact mine will detonate on anything it hits, if it hits hard enough. Uh, influence mine will detonate on any like influence that is just strong enough. And, and that's it. It's either yes or no. Uh, so, and, and typically these, these work on like one, one principle, they're really <clears throat> hardwired to some physical phenomenon, to a, typically a single physical phenomenon. Uh, either you hit something or a magnetic mine, if you have a magnetic field that is high enough, then it will induce a current in some loop and that will then detonate detonate a mine or it, you can have some kind of lever with actual magnets and then they will tilt and move a little bit and they make a contact and then you get detonation uh, the, these ones also they they have very long operational life and such as these they, can, they don't even need batteries if the certain kind of, that they can be operational for 50 years in certain good conditions. Uh, if, if you have something that actually requires batteries, then it will be operational until the battery runs out. And that's something that you might not know when it actually happens. So kind of the requirements for smart mines, that what do you need to have in order that you could call your mind smart or, or modern? Uh, this is a list of, of many things and these they don't present all in one mind uh, some of them are are in the mind some of them are things that you're going to see in the future so that one big thing is increased confidence and and with confidence i mean confidence that that what you measure with your system you can say that this is my target and, and that requires sensors, uh, sensor fusion, and signal processing. So you have several different kinds of sensors. Typical modern influence mines rely at least on acoustics, magnetics, and pressure. They can have also other sensors such as UEP or underwater electric field, and seismic, photonic, and other things. Sensor fusion, so that you get data from all the senses. You should, uh, modern mind should never basically detonate just from basic one sensory input. You should have more. Uh, then the signal processing could give you uh, other things like the target recognition, meaning that you have some kind of idea but where is that signal coming from that you are measuring? Uh, natural phenomena that happens, let's say, in the Earth magnetic field is really different from what is happening when there is a ship passing by. Both of them will make a change. But, but what, what is the, uh, the quality of the change can tell you that this is a man-made or this is a natural phenomenon. Uh, then you can have even further recognition. You could say that this is a ship, this is something else. Then within a ship, you could say this is a small ship and this is a big ship. And in some cases, you can, you can say that this is a gray ship and this is, of, of, this is probably a gray ship and this is a commercial ship. There are differences in, in the signals that they actually they emit. And if you have possibility to measure them and, and process them, 
then then you can get an idea what 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 is going on on the surface or somewhere nearby on the surface. And and then when we if we combine these with uh, like machine learning or and these kind of algorithms, then then we can do this so-called fingerprinting. So we can we can identify maybe with certain uh, confidence. We could say that the target is a certain class of chips, or or maybe even a, a, a certain certain specific chip. Then what you can get is tracking. So you can, you can track where the actual chip is going. You will need several hydrocarbons to do that. But then you, then you know that it's coming towards you. Uh, you could say that that, that it the estimate the closest point approach and say that this is within the damage radius of your mind to, to help to make the decision should it detonate or not. And then this my, uh, mind sweeping detection. You would like that your opponent cannot sweep your minds. So you can, you can let, let's say, very old influence mind sweeps are, they are not really effective against really smart mind if they have, have uh, good algorithms for preventing the mind sweeping. They can say that this is a sweep, and this is not a relationship. So this is the, the everlasting captain mind mm -hmm. game. You have some kind of measure, then you have a counter measure, then you have a counter counter measure, and then you will have a counter 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 measure. Yeah. Uh, these ones are basically what you have on the central technology. Then, then what you want, or, 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 or let's say when we talk to people, the, the, these these are things that they typically would like to have in their minds. Uh, are remote some kind of remote operation, for instance, a friendly pass. So you could somehow remotely uh, tell the minefield to shut it itself off for a while, put it to sleep, and then you could pass it by yourself. And after a certain period, it would be activated again. And then sterilization. So you could sterilize the mine with some remote control command, making it basically harmless. Uh, you program the mines when you deploy them, and you might want to reprogram them at some point without laying a new mine or or sterilizing <clears throat> this mine and picking it up and reprogramming it but but you could do it with some kind of remote operation then then i think that i believe that will happen in the future is networking a minefield consists of individual mines each of them are, are have their own senses so they basically have their own ears but they don't talk to each other. So each of them is by themselves looking for the target and constantly thinking, should I go off? Should I go? Should I go off? And with networking, these could communicate to communicate with each other. So the minefield could have some kind of um, situational awareness what happens there. It wouldn't be the, all of the minds wouldn't be just working individually, <clears throat> but they would uh, work together. Then uh, a big thing is withdrawal, meaning that once you've deployed your mind, you would like to get it back. So the minds should always be programmed to be sterilized after a certain period. That, that is what you think is the should be the lifespan. And, and that should happen before the batteries run out. And after that, the mine would be safe. So you could pick it up, maybe put it in, 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 in maintenance, and then back to your uh, depot storing to be ready to be used again. Then 
one thing is mobility. This, this, this can either mean that the mine would have some kind of means to uh, deploy itself to a certain point, a certain place, or that it could relocate itself from the original deployed position. Or when it senses a target, it could move closer to the target to get a better effect. Then maybe the most important thing is safety. This should be safe to use. And we don't want to end up in the similar situation that we had at the Second World War, where there are tons of mines that are still active, and they can be active up to 30 years, and they're still dangerous. And they should be not, not, not only after their life, they should be safe uh, to store. They should be safe uh, to deploy and to use, operate, but they then should be also safe after the intended, intended life. And then, of course, retrofits. Many navies have a huge stockpile of old mines, and they would like to get all of this as a plug-in option for their old mines instead of procuring new ones. One, one, one big thing that what enables this is basically the same technology advancements that we see in, in all, all fields of our life. This is just the comparison what has happened in, in, with mobile phones in 20 years. I used to have one of these, these Nokia 33110. Uh, I could play the snake game. I could change my ringtone. I even got. Uh, I, I could get a new background picture by SMS, and, and, and this was something that was totally like sci-fi twenty years before in in telephones. Nowadays, I I, I carry iPhone. It has four cameras. It it, it can do real time face recognition. Has huge amount of apps. These are things that we like face recognition. This is thing, thing that we think that this is something funny and you just fool around with it. But but this is basically just the same thing that you would like to do in a mine. You would like to know, to recognize from the signals, is this my target or not? And that, that phone actually contains almost all of the mine sensor, sensors that are used in modern mines. It has an acoustic sensor. It has a magnetic sensor. It has a photonic sensor. It doesn't have that kind of pressure sensor, but, but otherwise, they are not really suited for, for, for my use. But but basically, and everything is fitted over there. The, the, the big problem is the last bullet point that you have to charge at every night. So, with a mine, you cannot go there with your USB charger every night, extend the life for one day more. And, and that, that is the big problem with, with mines that they have to run on batteries and they have to run on batteries for a long time, let's say one year or two years or three years or something, something like that. And they should be operational all the time. So you, you, you cannot have very uh, intensive like computation and signal processing going on all the time. But what, what, what I will be carrying in my pocket after 20 years, I don't know, will I be carrying anything called phone after 20 years? I don't, I don't know. But, but I think that then, then these figures will look silly to me. Like, ha, oh, 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 I had only four cameras. Can you imagine that? So uh, I am from Finland, and to, together with company Forsit, we uh, and and the group we have a this kind of cooperation. So we we produce uh, sea mines, 
Posit is providing all the explosives, we are providing all the electronics. And we have four different different mines. The first one is Blocker, and this is in, in operational use in Finland. The other three are not yet in operational use. Uh, there is Turso, that is a, a more influence mine. And then there is a, a bottom mine that, that can be deployed from a torpedo tube. And then there is a coastal mine or really, really shallow waters, unlike <clears throat> anti invasion mine. All of these share basically the same multi sensor system. All of them have a very insensitive munitions, meaning that that the, these are actually really hard to explode unintentionally. Uh, you, you don't get sympathetic detonation. You can shoot at it with basically shape charge. It, it won't detonate. And, and these, these have been tested. They're powerful, but they're safe and, and cost efficient. And we are constantly developing, especially the, the sensor systems and, and the, the signal processing. So uh, the more mine is for more deeper waters, and, and then the blocker mine is for shallow waters. Bonds for basically just near the um, coastline. Again, it's not only about mines, but you also need modern mine laying systems. And, and the, here we have two examples of uh, this kind of mission module based uh, mine laying system. The first is by Danish company SH Defense, and it is called the system. Uh, the, the system itself is basically uh, the, the, the container thing that you have there, and it's, it's, it's not related to mines that you can have all different kind of payloads. And, and then there is this uh, Sumiko. That, that has been developed for, for mine laying content, container based mine laying where in the containers you can you can store your mines you can put it on board basically any vessel that can handle containers and then you can lay the mines from the containers <clears throat> yeah about the, the, the different platforms so you can lay mine from submarines from modern warships uh, some mines can be laid from, from uh, fixed wing aircrafts. You can have uh, dedicated mine layers. Uh, there's a picture of, of, of the blocker mine being deployed from a hovering helicopter. And then you can lay mines from, from like small, fast boats. So, Sea mines are still a valid weapon. 20 years ago, I would say that many nations were giving up all of their mine laying capability. And now uh, many of them are, are building it up again. So with mines, you can raise the threshold for attack, canalize sea traffic, anti-access area denial, and get yourself uh, some time to react. Modern influence mines are, are smart, safe, and uh, a different way of, of laying the mines. Uh, then it, it's it's really time assuming and difficult to find and destroy mines that is uh, during, especially during a crisis time. But, but then, of course, it's, it's a nuisance after the, after the war, and, and therefore it, it's good that they have like sterilization options and, and, and possibility to, to pick them up and reuse them. 
whether Navy is actually would pick up the mines, it's then of course up to the Navy and their doctrine how they will use this. But but more modern mines have this kind of capability. So that's it. Do you have a question from the audience or from the online? Yeah, I, I, I'm the uh, so you mentioned that one of the future development developments, what you can see when it comes to the scene map is the networking. Uh, in the other fields, we see that uh, the new uh, next generation scene mines uh, uh, were. Will, uh, will go for it. Yes, yeah. uh, one thing that I think two things is, is maybe one of this the, the mobility thing that is still uh, uh, like our minds don't have that, but that that would be one. So so they will be more like a hybrid thing, some something between a torpedo and a mine instead of the old traditional mine. So in the future, I think we have to rethink what do we mean by mine. So uh, and they might be used in a different way. Uh, other thing is that you would instead of using mines as, as, as huge mine fields, you would use them more as like precision weapons. If if you can, when when the processing technology comes better, you get you 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 will get better like confidence on on selecting certain targets and in, in, in this kind of case you could start using mines more as a precision weapon than, than like the old traditional anti-access weapon and one more question so uh, you mentioned that uh, the port company or not operate to reset what about the location do you basically my my question is based so uh do you get any, I wouldn't say demands, but uh, uh, any inputs from the Navy or, or the technologies kind of demands where, where the Navy will mind from the Navy will mind forward, uh, water is, uh, is heading. Yeah, I would say that we, we have a quite close connection to the Finnish Navy, of course. And thinking about it, we 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 are like a defense company, and I would say that the defense company can never be credible defense company if it doesn't operate with its own like own, own, own navy. So uh, we we do a lot of things. We we the Finnish navy has been very much present when we've been developing these these systems and, and we as a company would never have such resources to do all the like live firing testing and all the sea trials and everything that is related to these so in in, in, the, in that sense there is a lot of uh, information exchange between us Since the security situation has changed now over the past few years, do you see the market is growing? Do you see more interest from Ravanese and other nations? Yeah. Which is kind of weapons. And also, uh, do you see that it's, so is it, is it easy to work with other countries or it's because of sensitivities? So, that's one, do you see any constraints here or it's uh, changing somewhere? Uh, the, the Question to the first is there increased demand? It is yes, there is a huge increase increase in the demand. Uh, other thing is it is it easy to work with them? I would say the sensitivity issues is is a big thing. When the the most sensitive things in in modern mines are the algorithms. So so basically the old mines they were really 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 fancy and smart as, as i told you new mines are kind of boring in that sense that they're just a big heap of explosives with a computer hooked to it so uh all, all the, the intelligence is, is there in the computer and and in, in the algorithm 
and and to discuss these kind of details with other customers that that, that is probably the most difficult thing and, and that is something that we might not actually then really discuss. We, we get some kind of requirements, what they need to do. Uh, the customers can develop their own algorithms for their minds. We don't have to know about how they're going to use it and, and, and stuff like that. And, and then there is the possibility that they have like a government to government data exchange with, with the Finnish Navy instead of us. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about Denver's. Uh, in the last September, there were explosions on Nord Stream uh, gas pipeline. Uh, do you see any, say, uh, possibility if you use your imagination to develop the algorithm uh, that somehow uh, would um, make it possible to use the mining in order to protect um, the underwater infrastructure? In the time that this is well, probably a period of tension, but uh, not uh, possibly yet. Um, I think this is a this is a very good but very very hard question. Uh, there, I think there are a few things. One one with, with with the mine is of course that if you put the mine next to the gas pipe. Mm -hmm. And then, okay. then, then, you, then you see that now it's coming. <laughs> uh, we'll take it out. <laughs> then, then that, that, is, that is one part of the problem. Uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I guess I, I, I cannot well, believe there's no rather no than yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe if you can you, you pr protect it. From from further, but but maybe something some some other system that you would you would detect underwater activity then then could be more useful than mm -hmm. than real mines. Mm -hmm. Actually, there is a scene that there is a market to produce uh, constant uh, sensor systems for. Uh, Looking about uh, gas pipes and electrical lines, which can be there all the time. Mm, yes, but uh, they are similar with mine sensors. Yes, I'm so saying... long like battery and uh, sensors to detect uh, what's going on. Mm. So that market is open. Yes, uh, for 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 the kind of target detection technology. The market is 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 not only mines. There are other things as well. Yeah, yeah I'm Ivo Schroeder, it's safe for Estonia and uh, You said about uh, anti-sweeping capability of the mine. How much you pay attention to uh, uh, to the hunting uh, uh, the protection against hunting or you know difficult to detect with hunting techniques? Uh, okay, this is also a good question. Uh, if we think about the where ideas where we develop these mines, uh, first of all, our, our mines, we talk about our mines, they, they are not designed to be like super stealthy and, and super difficult to find. It, it's more like that that we lay the minefields and we tell everyone that go go there, there are mines. Uh, but then if we think about if we think think about that that the sensors that could we detect a diver and say yes could we detect uh rov or uav coming near the, near the mine i would say yes but, but then the question what should we do then is is something is that's an operational thing and it's something that we don't it, it's not our business uh, Navy, it's it's the Navy's business how they want to operate their mines and what would they like to do in these kind of situations. Yeah, I have also a question about remote uh, controlling. Uh, this has shown that if something can be controlled remotely, then it's possible to take over the uh, control. How much is that a question? Yeah, that, that is a 
that that's a big thing and, and that remote control is typically i would say that when we talk with different potential customers that's typically on, on the on the list but then quite typically at some point they don't want it to communicate so there is the possibility that someone will steal your password so to say and then they get the access I need last question. How is possible to access their museum and person? Uh, you you contact oh, okay. <laughs> me. <laughs> and of course, I wish you all welcome there. Hey, I have my small question too, if you don't mind. Because it comes back to the previous presentation. I think when Nico, you were talking about the reuse of the of old mines, that's how we rebuild the this German the new system. And uh, you mentioned that um, basically you need the explosive material and the, the computer. So that uh, when, we talk, when, when we look that we still clear up this uh, World War II, like a military waste from the sea. And so that, like, my question is if this new technology, modern mines, are more environmentally or sustainable friendly, or uh, look at this sort of material waste? So that, yeah. uh, there, there, I think there are two. Two aspects to this question. The first, first is that that you make the mine safe after its use, so that it's not a threat anymore. And and that that happens basically through the sterilization. When when you deploy the mine, you you will uh, program the mine to be sterilized after a certain time, and after that it is it is safe. Uh, then the other question is more this kind of environment friendly question uh, if you pick it up then there will won't be any waste uh, if you leave it there then of course you will have something in the seabed that naturally doesn't belong there uh, then it, it may be a i would say that uh, one thing is that there are more and more different kind of uh, environmental regulation going on when we talk about like anything and all this, like electronics and stuff like that they they cannot use all the hazardous materials anymore that much uh if we talk about old old mines with with tnt that is understand it's quite poisonous material itself uh so so also the, all these kind of aspects come through the regulation, um, but it, in the end, then it's up, up to the Navy and their doctrine that will they leave all the stuff there or not. And it, it's not only you that will be laying mines, it's, it's your opponent that will be laying mines and uh, you, you shouldn't then rely that, that they are safe. Yeah. So, so those mines you still have to deal with some kind of basic old-fashioned methods like hunting or sweeping or or something else you should maybe just go there and hook a rope and pick it up mm -hmm. it's an extremely risky thing to do okay thank you thank you very much you guys thank you now it's um, let's see we have the but this uh, representative from sweden from stockholm media are you online <laughs> Good. So um, thank you so much for inviting me. I um, unfortunately I missed the, the introduction today because my train was a bit late. Uh, but um, anyhow, uh, I my name is uh, Mirja Arnshov and I work at the National Maritime Museum in Stockholm. And I'm an archaeologist, uh, and I'm I'm. Um, into the archaeology of the recent past. So I'm not like the, the prehistoric kind of archaeologist. Uh, so I, I have worked a lot with uh, maritime heritage, but this um, topic, naval mines, that's something quite new to me. So I'm still uh, learning a lot. So it's been really good to, to listen to you today. And um, yeah, I, this is what I will present today is very much uh, like work in progress. <clears throat> so 
I think, and I haven't, I haven't presented this before, so I, I think that uh, I, I will um, kind of uh, talk about my uh, my thoughts, uh, my preliminary thoughts this far, and what I've been doing and what I'm thinking uh, about, and so on. And then maybe you can have some input and, and ask questions and, and so on. And I'd love to have some uh, some input and suggestions, perhaps towards the end. So I will start with saying a few words about why I started to, to catch up an interest in mines. <laughs> um, and um, well, try to situate this uh, research a little bit where, where my starting points are and what, what kind of uh, thoughts that made me look into this, um, so to say. And also some conclusions from a very a brief study that I did on, on uh, the collections of the Swedish Natural Maritime Museums a couple of years ago. And uh, a paper that, that I did um, on early mine experiments. I have not had like a devoted project really to see mines, but I've tried to, to fit it into other when, when I've had the opportunity. So, so. And also, I was in, invited uh, to a workshop last autumn about um, uh, heritage, unreal heritage. I, I just finishing now a, a paper for this uh, uh, book that will be out later this year, I guess, at Bloomsbury Academic. So I will say a few words about this, which I've been struggling with quite a lot actually this spring. And then, um, what I'm really looking forward to, and that is more of a sort of um, writing for a wider audience uh, about naval mines and sea mines. And, and, and I start a little bit, and, but this will, I guess, take quite a long. That's something that I do in my spare time. So, um, yes, why mines then? Uh, well, as, as I told you, I, I have not been working with this topic um, before, but I, I, some of you who know me, you know that I've, I've been, um, lately I've been doing a lot of research about uh, Baltic refugees coming to Stockholm by, in escape boats during the Second World War. And I was writing my thesis on this subject uh, and winding it up like in 2020. Uh, and I, when, while I was doing this, just finishing this thesis. Uh, I was working at Stockholm University, where you can see the little red dot here, uh, and um, pretty close to Stockholm city center. So I was sitting there among the archaeologists in the building, and then I got a phone call from a man who said he had found a strange thing, which he thought was a perhaps a sea mine just a few hundred meters away from my office. And he wondered if, if anybody knew anything about uh, sea mines. And uh, well, I, I didn't at that time, but I thought, still I thought it was interesting and I got a bit curious to, uh, and that made me in a way start thinking that uh, it's, it's peculiar that, that the mine like this, I think, I don't know, but I think this might be an old Russian mine. Uh, and it was probably reused as a buoy for more rings, anchorings, leisure boats in this uh, water. Uh, and I, I found it very funny that, that the mines were so close and even in this very in the city area. Uh, and then just a few weeks later, I, I was uh, at my at holiday on my summer cottage at, at the island of Gotland, you know, in the middle of the Baltic. And I just passed a, a lighthouse uh, place uh, near the coast and I found this mine lying around there. And I, I got a bit curious, uh, so I, you can see the, it is open in the top, uh, so I put my cell phone into it and to, to have some light and see <laughs> what was inside and, and so on. And then there was a lot of noise all of a sudden and, and I coming from inside the mine and I got really scared and like yeah, my heart started beating. So uh, like a, my a re reaction. 
And then I, I said to myself that this is really funny also that well, this mine has been lying around here for probably 100 years and uh, still it has the capacity to, to frighten me because I'm sort of trained to, to be a bit careful with this kind of objects, although I've never experienced a war or anything like that. I mean, there has been no war in Sweden for more than 200 years. But uh, still, uh, it made me think that those mines, they have a lot of agency to them. And the reason those <laughs> noises were coming from the mines was that there were a bird nest inside of it. This is an area uh, which is a, a nature reserve for, for birds. So they had found a, a safe place to, to stay at. And then I started thinking a little bit about mines and just going through my, the photos that I've taken when I've been around in coastal areas and so on, then it, it, uh, it struck me that those mines, the sea mines, they seem to be pretty much everywhere today. Um, and still I haven't really thought about them, but they, they've just like been melted into <laughs> to the background in a way. And uh, they are found in, in very in a variety of, of environments, so I would say. They are like used as decorations, you, they, you have them just next to summer houses and stuff. Also at um, places where people go to have some lunch and coffee, so uh, and uh, at shores, of course. Uh, and they they are really part of the coastal landscape, but I hadn't really acknowledged it be before. And uh, also, as uh, I understand now, most of these mines are not Swedish. Some of them are, of course, but many of them are like runaway mines that have come ashore during the wars or, or, or afterwards. So then <laughs> I also, when I started thinking about mines, I also, they also started to appear sort of in, in art and literature when I was just reading or thinking about what I have read or, or pictures that were shown uh, so obviously they they've been uh, they they are they are part of uh, even this kind of I mean there are several Nobel Prize winner winners in literature who have written poems and stuff about mines also uh, so this is something else I think than the kind of stories that I used to hearing about mines uh, when they are part of naval warfare and so on. And there's absolutely nothing wrong. I mean, those stories are super important, but I just started to think that there seem to be like a broader picture here and uh, that mines are also sort of part of heritage and, and have a cultural history that might be nice to, to sort of um, tell a little bit about and explore. And what I also found really interesting was that mines are obviously reused in, in several uh, innovative ways. You know, the, the picture to the left there, you, I guess you um, uh, recognize it, perhaps it's from uh, Nessar or uh, yeah, Narjö in Swedish, uh, with the flags. But they're also used for, like I said earlier, for boys and for, for um, like portals or marking entrances or, and, creating sort of a cozy atmosphere, a maritime atmosphere also. So obviously they are not <laughs> always like scary weapons, but they, they have um, other values as well. And, but then of course there are also mines that, that are really like dangerous and risky and that keep uh, scaring us. And, this uh, is perhaps most obvious when it comes to those mines that have, have uh, uh, come adrift and, uh, and um, that come ashore. And this happens in Sweden at least several times e each year that, that, that people uh, discover mines by chance and, and call 
uh, the Navy who, who need, needs to go there and, and, and take care of it. And uh, you can read about it in newspapers and stuff every time it happens. Uh, and I also find it a bit uh, interesting that, that they still, it's like the past resurfacing and, and uh, we need to take a lot of uh, precautions and, and uh, react when this, every time this happens. So a few years, a couple of years ago, I got a small grant from, from uh, the delegation for uh, naval history research <laughs> or something like that in Sweden to just have a, a, a brief look about the mines, uh, the collection, mine collections at the Swedish maritime and naval museums to see what kind of mines there were and what stories that, that were told about and, and, and so on. And, and what I found was that most of those were, were Swedish models, which of course not all of them, but, but a clear majority. And that is because the Swedish Navy have offered them to, to the museums when they didn't need them anymore. Uh, so it's a, it's a really nice collection, but it's not really, it's another picture than the one that I had learned uh, it, from my experience, like in, in this, along the Swedish East Coast, where the mines were obviously foreign, mostly. So this doesn't really mirror, in a way, the experience that Swedish coastal people at least have had with the mines and the kind of relations that's been going on and so on. Also, I, I learned that, that those collections are a, a little bit tricky to, to curate, that they are a bit challenging, uh, actually. There are projects going on at our museums and, and other museums like the Army Museum in Stockholm and so about trying to make sure that those uh, objects are uh, risk-free, that they don't, that there are no explosives or, or some sort of liquids that might be harmful inside of them. And it is pretty, pretty difficult sometimes to, to, uh, to know about that. And that I think is also interesting um, that uh, we have had the, the Navy helping us to, to sort of go through the collections and they have actually had, have had to move a few mines from exhibitions uh, because they couldn't really uh, guarantee that they were 100% safe. Uh, and it, it is hard sometimes to have a look inside them. They are really disclosed objects. And uh, the museums were uh, got some critique also that we don't really make sure. I mean, the, the best way would probably be to, to have a marking on the actual mine shell that this, this mine has been checked and it's, it's neutralized, it's, it's totally undangerous. Uh, but that would in a little bit change the appearance of the original object. So we don't really want to do that. And then we work with like catalog systems and, and information that is migrated in databases and stuff. And then it easily happens that uh, new generations of curators, they don't uh, get access to this information and then they need to start the work over again uh, to check on the mines because information ha have been lost. Uh, also, having a look in the photo archive of the museum, it, <laughs> I found out that th there is a special kind of like taking photographs or, or, or posing with these mines. You often place your kids or yourself or, or, or someone like on, on them and you want to touch them and take a, a funny picture. And this, I think, um, is a little bit interesting also. They, it resembles in a way I mean, the, the same thing is obviously going on with uh, cannons. Uh, and it re I think there are some similarities with how people like pose when they have shot some big wildlife like a tiger or something or an elephant. So it's a little bit like a triumph and, and uh, playing a lot with uh, something that is in a way dangerous but has been tamed or, or made harmless in a way. 
Uh, that made me think a little bit about how, how the minds are sort of um, addressed uh, like monsters. I would come back to that. Then I, I got, uh, I am part right now in a project that uh, deals with, um, uh, it's called the Lost Navy and it deals with uh, the Swedish naval fleet and um, how, how it has not been how there are many stories and aspects of it that has not been acknowledged. And we work with the life biography perspective to try to, to sort of uh, uh, tell more about the naval the ships that used to form part of, of the Swedish Navy. And uh, within this, I, I, I was asked to write a contribution to, to uh, Professor Leo Schmiller in this little book you see, Connected Oceans. And I thought that um, since Karlskrona, the naval, Swedish naval base, is an important um, place in this project, I thought I might write a little bit about early sea mine experiments in this um, in Karlskrona. And there are some really beautiful uh, um, archive materials and drawings from a Swedish admirer. He was active in the, the late 18th century, and he uh, he had some experiments going on with uh, mines, and he blew uh, <laughs> several ships like to test the impact of the mines. Uh, so that is probably part of the underwater heritage of this Karlskrona today. Uh, and then uh, there turned out that there had been several of, of old ships that were used as target vessels um, in early mine experiments. And that is perhaps not very surprising, but um, still I thought it was kind of interesting to just to tell a little about. And, and it is in, in a way very, a bit thought provoking that those old ship of the line, like sailing ships designed by a famous shipwright of Schapman and others in, in the late 18th century that they were actually <laughs> blown up by mines towards the end of, of their career uh, because you wouldn't think that mines and, and uh, the sailing navy were like sort uh, part of the same uh, that they would ever meet in a way uh, and some of these old uh, ships that were really they were really novelties when they were designed but then uh, would within just a generation, they were so <laughs> old fashioned. Uh, but they were then uh, reinforced with iron structures and so on to be able to evaluate the impact of mines on, on more modern ships that were new in this period. And then afterwards, those old uh, naval ships were taken into dry docks and so on, so you could evaluate the damage. So that, that was, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, a way for me to, to get to know the, the early, the history of, of naval mine fair in a little way. But then uh, I was in, invited to this workshop, um, a no Norwegian workshop of, about uh, called Unruly Heritage. And it was about um, how heritage is not only something that we sort of some nice picks uh, picks out and and uh, some nice things that we need want to to curate and safeguard and so on, but a lot of things we sort of inherit from the past, it's just there uh, it, without us having chosen it. We just need to uh, cope with it. <laughs> so the mines are a good example, I think, of that kind of heritage that can uh, that be a bit problematic perhaps and that has sort of uh, yeah that has um, that's just around <laughs> and I try to discuss a little bit if this can be um, be a sort of understood as monstrous materialities which is something that some archaeologists are kind of interested in and discuss uh, whether objects can be monstrous and uh, are there some moral I don't know, dimensions of, of certain objects that humans have invented and that has been uh, created in order to do harm and so on. I, I found out, having looked a little bit at the mines, this paper deals 
specifically with the mines that are still around on the sea floor. And as we've learned today, the, they are quite a lot of them from the both world wars. But still, it's not that easy that, that you can really say that they uh, are monstrous in a way. Of course, they have, they have, they have had a role to play. Now they have, uh, they work in in other ways, so to say, and they are problematic in in many ways uh, when it comes to to uses of the sea and so on. And we need to adjust sometimes. Uh, well, what kind of activities we can do on the sea floor and, and so on. And, and they are really threatening. Uh, and uh, it's a good thing that, that they are um, being cleared in, in areas where there are a lot of, of risks, of course. But still, uh, it, it is also possible that they actually do have some kind of protective um, role towards marine life nowadays. I know that they are often discussed as a problem to the environment because the, the environment in the Baltic is very vulnerable and, and the, 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 those old mine heritage, they are a disturbance in, on the seafloor. But when in the certain areas, like there are some areas in Sweden where, where you're not really supposed to go fishing or trawl or do construction work or anything because there are uh, mine risk areas, it's sort of um, reasonable to assume that the mines also have a protective effect here. And, and uh, when there are no f fishing zones, for, in, for example, their uh, marine life can uh, regenerate and, and, uh, and so on and uh, be a bit healthy actually, because uh, humans are also kind of a disturbance that would otherwise perhaps uh, mortgage this and do things here. So it's a very complex, I would say, matter. And also we have uh, these uh, problems about mine clearance today, which often involves explosive uh, to detonate the mines. And, and that is also very problematic, to, especially to uh, marine uh, mammals and marine life that are dependent on, on their hearing. Uh, so there are some really um, worrying uh, results from um, uh, like harbor poor poor I, I don't really know the name the dolphin like uh, creature that are really an endangered species there are like 500 left in the Baltic and uh, after some demining operations in in the Danish water I think about 40 were found dead afterwards so we really need to think it's not that easy that the mines are always uh, sort of um, a risk to the environment. Some, in some cases, it can be the actual human interference when we start to to, uh, to demine. That is a great problem, perhaps. Also, those mines can have, or they do have a certain effect on on um, cultural heritage, which uh, because they also sort of form barriers for for trolls and so on that would otherwise. Um, risk uh, the older wrecks. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I will go into this. These are complicated things that I, I have no answers to, to. I just wanted to sort of um, point out that there are several like pros and cons and aspects of these situations. But then, um, I have this. Um, I, I have this idea to write a bit more po popular book about naval mines, uh, and so I try to. Um, when I come up with like, the, I hear that there is a certain story which I think could could be a good story, an essay to to illustrate some aspect of of those mines that are the old mines that are still around today. I, I try to write, write a little bit about it. Uh, so I will just give you a few examples. You get a rough idea of what this future <laughs> book will look like. Uh, and for instance, it uh, can be about how, uh, how mines were 
sort of um, uh, reused as, uh, as all kinds of items really, but in this case uh, for planting flowers, like a giant flower pot. And there are actually instructions here where you, in, in a very popular Swedish newspaper where they step by step uh, tell you how to neutralize a Russian mine and, and uh, turn it into a planting uh, yeah, pot. <laughs> And you can see them uh, here and there, actually. And I and this is also this comes in a way with the thinking, which is explained here that that those mines and the flowering pots pots will remind about uh, the dark wartime era, and uh, it's a way of sort of dealing with the past and 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 uh, moving on and and planting flowers in those uh, old weapons and so on. So I think that's is kind of interesting. Also, the, the mines, they are, they are, they have created a, a great heritage in a way, or great, perhaps that's the wrong, the wrong word, it's a tragedy of course, but there are a lot of, of shipwrecks today on the Baltic Sea floor that, that are the result of, of mine accidents and the, in Sweden, at least, those are not protected by law, which I think uh, is uh, a shame. Uh, I think some of them are really uh, important uh, historic sites, actually. But, uh, but this is also why mines have been historically very um, heated, almost, and, and why there are those, all those ideas about monsters and, and stuff around. Uh, they they have are responsible for a lot of deaths, uh, but still there are also the side where the mines are curated as as heritage. They are museums and they are sold and action houses and stuff. So yeah, I think that's is just we are like trying to to uh, destroy them, or we wish we could at least. <laughs> they, a bit too many in, in the on the sea floor, but then there is this other practice where they are actually curated and uh, sort of at museums and so on. And uh, and, and um, also some of those models are very rare, um, from what I understand. There are poor documentations of some some of them and so on. And then there is the whole uh, the whole uh, heritage on the sea floor, mine anchors and so on. Then we we're speaking about Yuminda and other barriers earlier on. That uh, I think also is a very important um, heritage from the wars, uh, in a way. Um, yeah, and this is uh, another example of a mine. The, that is on a small island in the middle of the sea almost. You can see yeah, the, the map here and the little dot. This is a very small island. Uh, and I write about some of the mines that have been part of everyday life in this fishing cottage. It was, um, there were several mines that came ashore here. Um, and uh, one of them was used as a boy in the small harbor. Another one actually, blew apart a big chunk of the, the bedrock, so it, it sort of created a new <laughs> site with a special place name on this island. And then we have this uh, mine that was put on the, the top of, of the island and where people used to go and, and uh, have the binoculars against it to, to have a look to see where they could go seal hunting or fishing today and so on. So this, this uh, mine has actually become a very important part of the landscape here. It is a very naked island, just rocks and uh, not, nothing there almost. So people have, of course, made use of the things that they found that came, came floating. And, and uh, I think uh, it is interesting that how much when reading about, reading in those diaries and stuff about life here, how much this mine have meant and how it has sort of become an integrated part of the island uh, and the place on the island. So, and then um, coming back to this issue with, with the mines as monsters, which was pretty common in, uh, to address them as monsters in, in after the wars, 
uh, I also find this interesting with the, the how mines were reused as money collecting boxes after the wars for in support for the families of, of uh, seamen who had lost their lives in, in uh, accidents and, and due, due to sea mines. Uh, and they, they were really common, as I understand, in Denmark and in Norway. In, in many villages, those mines uh, were placed in, in the central, uh, in, in the cities and so on, and people could then put money into them. And often they have these little signs stating that they were created in order to do harm and, uh, and uh, they are responsible for deaths and so on. But nowadays they, they try to sort of... Uh, help and and uh, comfort and, and and so on so i that is something that i look forward to uh, working on this how this heritage also transformed final example uh, this um, map as you can see here uh, to the left shows uh, uh, the island of gotland in the baltic sea and uh, on this map some some but who was interested in, in uh, runaway mines uh, have marked every place where a mine came ashore during the First World War. It's a map that was also used for, uh, for pointing out where he was going on small bicycle tours with his family. So, <laughs> uh, but I find it really fascinating because it gives them such a good understanding of how many mines that actually came to this part um, to, to this island that was not actually part of the war, but nevertheless. And uh, some, uh, sometimes this did not end happily. Like, um, Mikko <laughs> was speaking earlier about this um, Russian fishing mine. And uh, there are some examples like this, uh, this stone you can see here where uh, a, a naval officer went to, to try to neutralize the, the disarm a mine that were of an unfamiliar type to him and it um, detonated so he and the farmer found the mine on the beach they uh, passed away unfortunately and you can see on the stone here that people are still I mean this was uh, in the, during the first world war so it's been quite a while but but it still sort of echoes in the local to the locals here, so you can see the people go here and put fossils, like beautiful little stones, uh, by by this um, yeah mon monument. And I was, uh, it was really great. I I went to to Turku to Obo um, the other week, and Mikko just showed me around for two full days, trying to teach me about naval mines and and we had a look in the DA group facility there but to so I could uh, have a look at one of those mines that actually uh, caused this accident here and there were several of those coming ashore just in the weeks afterwards uh, but but uh, uh, luckily no more um, accidents because people were a bit yeah, they knew then to, to watch out a bit extra for these kind of mines. Yes, yeah, that uh, I hope you have a brief understanding of what I'm trying to sort of uh, do now. And uh, yeah, so thank you. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, I will try to, to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Some of my questions you did already answer, especially about this, how the, the local citizens knew how to deactivate them. But then on the newspaper is what the instructions I mean now I understood. That. So it wasn't any certain regulations or so it was very public. And but maybe one question I would have, like uh, what do you think when the sea mines have been taken into the account as a decoration on this sort of between in among the civilians, like have you seen from your material when it's actually started? When it started, well, often it's it's kind of tricky to follow when the mines were, uh, but I, I guess, I think they were there from very early on. You can see on some historic 
uh, photographs, for instance, that mines are placed uh, at entrances and as decorations and so on. So, um, yeah, I think I think it dates quite back to, to when they were actually dropped in the sea. Mm -hmm. Because yesterday, when I a little bit looked this up, also like we were we were thinking like um, is the sort of in Sweden is it known how much has gone to the drift or is it has been the sort of navy mapped a little bit about the sort of um, drifting mines or there is no such such thing at all. I don't know if there are any. I don't think uh, there are any national like from what I've heard. I know that there are. On the island of Gotland, 500 mines are known to have come just during the First World War. And that is from like people who have had a look at the newspaper. But I don't think there are any numbers for the whole of Sweden and the, both, both of the wars. Perhaps, perhaps some, something about how the, from the ones that the Navy have been involved in, maybe uh, mine sweeping and so on. Yeah. Any questions from the audience or from the online? Any wonderings, comments? It's not really a kind of a wondering and a comment because uh, we were speaking about the maritime heritage and uh, and the, and the mine, mines and mine fields. So now we have here persons that are conducting mine copper measures and, and EOD work and, and demining and, and clearing the fields. So I think uh, for my interest would be to collect of collect that data also from that that to to be able to see that what's their what's their underwater how they how they have have uh, how they how the mine fields have become there and are they are at the same place that they should be and because we have the documentation maybe from the from the late uh, period but not when they actually are then down there. And then kind of further <clears throat> thought that that should we also consider the as that as the maritime heritage and even even protect them in some way <laughs> and because uh, what would be actually quite interesting to leave some field or line of mines uh, if it's not dangerous or problematic leave it to be. And, and and so that the future generations will also <laughs> use, uh, detect it and see at least collect the data from from the mine clearing operations so that we could have data and then all the ROV pictures and and site scan sonar stuff and that like that yeah <laughs> that's a very interesting thought and. Uh, yeah. Because um, I think of, you know, in Pearl Harbor, there are some wrecks that are actually being protected as heritage, although they are hazardous to the environment, they're leaking oil and stuff, but they are supposed to do so because that also kind of keeps the memory alive. Uh, but that is an, uh, a very rare <laughs> example, I think. I don't know about uh, safeguarding explosive mines but i yes yeah maybe why maybe if we could in a safe way i think it would be great <laughs> but mm -hmm. mm. I, I have a question um mm. well i have a summer question from the western nation side of course i also have a water reservoir made of the german the ema EMB, my case and so forth so probably very common things in estonian shorelines as well, like packing the things, but I never kind of imagined that you could do a cultural study or an anthropological study on, on, on those things. Um, I mean, just return to a short visit to Ukraine. The Ukraine people, of course, are collecting the pieces of I don't know, Shahed drones and exploded caliber missiles and things which were supposed to kill them in the first place. But you know, everyone wants to have a souvenir. This is probably a common thing after every armed conflict. Do you know if, if there are any studies of those uh, killing weapons, you know, like the one of the last pictures you have uh, from Denmark, that the thing was meant to be for war and threat, but now it's for sorrow and, and, and so on. Is, is there any, any studies on other examples that they 
conflict as turning a killing weapon into something totally different. So, uh, the hearing is a little bit, uh, could you perhaps repeat the question a bit? Uh, uh, maybe you, uh, yeah, <laughs> hello, perhaps, if you. Do you know if there are any other studies, uh, both country studies where a weapon uh, which has been left in the battlefield and uh, people have collected it as a souvenir has turned into totally different, different things? Like if, if there are other examples of weapons that have been collected and, and reused by, was that a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yes, I think I I, I think of a, a German bomb that by accident uh, was um, fell down in in on the countryside in Småland in, in Sweden and. Before the authorities had sort of investigated it, uh, farmers and locals had collected lots of things as souvenirs, and they <laughs> still have them. And also this um, mine uh, layer, Albatross, the German big mine layer ship that's stranded on, on Gotland. There are bits and pieces, perhaps not of weapons, but, but like memorabilia from this wreck uh, in uh, many, many homes. Uh, in Gotland, so I guess there must be several examples of, of, of this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you, Miria, for a very interesting presentation. It kind of adds a very nice dimension for today's talks. And uh, now I will invite Otto here also. And um, as we are running out of the of time, it's been very interesting presentation and questions and uh, so we decided that uh, Otto will conclude a day and then I will uh, thank some people up to you and then we are going to Okay, well, the seminar, well, the concern is now given the cases in, I believe uh, we get a different perspective of view from both the historical side and even nowadays how the sea mines or the wrecks of the sea mines and how it can be called are uh, still uh, part of our cultural heritage, and actually, uh, this is not a new phenomenon or a new case uh, by any stretch of the word. Because, uh, for instance, in Estonia, from the 19 in the 1920s and 1930s, this was quite a common thing that the shells of the sea mines that were in, in found disarmed were used by local peoples, and there are even <clears throat> memoirs that uh, during the night times, uh, even in the early years of 1920s, it was quite common that the folks who lived on the shoreline would be constantly see flashes, which means that the sea mines that went adrift were still around, hit the shore and exploded. So th this wasn't a rare occurrence. And uh, when these uh, sea mine shells were taken out and people used them for whatever kind of decorations, even a hundred years back in the Australia. And there are even some mentions that people took the explosives out of it and used it as a poison rats or to get rid of bugs and stuff like that. And that's where we get the, the yellowish color which was in it. And uh, there were some cases that people even wiped their clothes and, and so forth. So th th this is not really something new uh, in this century, but it is uh, interesting and weird to see that it's still part of our culture and we still have them here. Uh, at the same time, judging from the historical perspective, it is also, I think, that one of the crucial elements to be taken here that the naval warfare, the geography of the naval warfare, warfare hasn't really changed in our region and that the sea mines as a naval weapon is still valuable as it was back 100 years ago and it is today and probably is in the picture the future also uh, unfortunately yeah we don't have much time <clears throat> for a deeper discussion but i would like to thank everybody for coming and viewing us via the internet all the presenters and Hela will hand over i will help you to thank everyone who participated today especially the presenter and uh, we would like to ask me and give that with some things from our museum
And also would like to thank Igor Fred for helping us. <laughs> And people from the online, I hope that you can visit us in Estonia and we can uh, thank you in person and uh, and yeah, so let's uh, hope to meet next time in person, but thank you Maria very much. Thank you, thank you. And of course, that everything will take place. Um, I should thank you yeah, first of all, Arta Oil. Arta, shop was for them. And uh, of course, without Laura, we wouldn't manage anything with the internet, with the uh, emails, and everything. So, organization of work. So, Laura, thank you very much for helping us. Sir. We thank the museum and all the institutions, and I hope to see you next time again. And uh, yeah, that's from me. So, we fall today. Thank you. 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 Thank you.